Okay. Um, Sergeant Sadowski, we are live. Good afternoon. And at this time, will sergeants please start their recordings? Our recording started. Thank you. And good afternoon and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. At this time, would all council members and council staff please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. Thank you, Chair Cornegie. We are ready to begin. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Council Member Robert Cornegie, Chair of the Council's Committee on Housing and Buildings. Thank you all for joining this hearing titled Oversight Community Land Trust and Land Banks. Even before COVID-19, New York City was facing a severe housing affordability and eviction crisis, with half of New Yorkers spending at least 30% of their income on rent. However, as the virus and its economic destruction swept across the city, the housing crisis became increasingly urgent and the critical need for stable and affordable housing became undeniable. Now more than ever, the city must explore new and innovative ways to facilitate the development and preservation of affordable housing units. Today, we'll be learning about the potential for community land trust and land banks to create and preserve permanently affordable housing in New York City. A community land trust is a nonprofit entity that owns land upon which affordable housing is built and maintains the affordability of units through the use of long-term renewable ground leases. A number of community land trusts already operate in the city of New York, and steps have been taken to increase their prevalence, including recent city council funding and a 2017 grant administered by HPD. A land bank is a government created nonprofit that is designed to convert vacant or tax delinquent properties into affordable housing. Similar to a community land trust, a land bank can retain title so land and to land and preserve the affordability of housing units built in or on it. Since, since 2011, the state has authorized the creation of 35 land banks and 26 are currently operating. However, there's not a land bank in the city of New York. Today, we'll learn about existing efforts related to community land trust and land banks in New York City. We'll also be hearing legislation, first proposed intro 118A sponsored by council member Lander, would establish a land bank in New York City. Second, intro number 1977, sponsored by Council Member Rivera, would give qualified entities a first opportunity to purchase and to submit an offer to purchase certain residential buildings when offered for sale. Third, we'll be hearing intro number 2044, sponsored by Council Member Holden, which would extend the existing two year moratorium on accessory sign violations and waive permit fees in connection with the installations of an accessory sign. Finally, we'll be hearing pre-considered intro number, uh, I don't have the number for that, sponsored by Council Member Dharma Diaz, which would amend local law 49 for the year 2019, which established a basement legalization pilot program to extend the deadline for applications to submit necessary construction documents by six months. I'd like to thank my colleagues from the Committee on Housing and Buildings present today. Um, I am working off my iPad, which only allows me four windows, so I can't see actually who is who is here, if you could announce yourselves, we could move forward. Uh, council members who are present, which unfortunately with this device, it makes it difficult for me to see. We'll now hear an opening statement as we wait for the, um, the roll call uh, from council member Salamanca, chair of the city council's committee on land use. Council member Salamanca. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Chair Cornegie, and thank you for the opportunity to address the Committee on Housing and Buildings. I would like first to recognize the tremendous amount of work from the affordable housing and community advocates who continue to fight for progress and accountability in their neighborhoods from this council and this administration. The legislation before us today are key components in the model of community stewardship that would help meet the challenge of the ongoing and severe housing crisis in New York City. The preservation of affordability is our overriding goal, but we've seen time and time again, the development of housing when controlled by private equity and interest do not serve the communities that are most in need. 
we must explore the role of community control of affordable housing, which can help prevent displacement and stabilize neighborhoods. The COVID-19 pandemic has made it clear we cannot go back to business as usual. The status quo in New York City means that nearly 58% of the residents in my district are burdened by the cost of their rent. The status quo means that the medium rent has grown by 31%, while unemployment in the Bronx remains the highest in the state. And under the status quo, these numbers are expected to get worse. Both in my district and citywide, I have supported the increased role of community land trusts in the preservation of affordable housing. And it is clear to me that there is room to explore how the proposed legislation meets our goals. And I look forward to hearing from those who have to come to testify today. Thank you, Chair Coyne. Thank you, Chair Salamanca. We will now hear an opening statement from Council Member uh, Brad Lander on proposed Lander. control. Hmm? Sorry. We're going to, move to the next opening, I actually want to list the council members who are present so we can get it. For oh, the thank record. you. Yeah, no worries. Um, in addition to Council Member Salamanca, we have Council Members Cabrera, Gibson, Jonai, Gradenchik, Lander, Lewis, Rivera, and Rosenthal. Thank you so much. That means we have a full house. Thank you, colleagues, for joining me. Uh, we'll now hear an opening statement from Council Member Lander on sponsored proposed intro 118A. Thank you so much, Chair Cornegie. It's good to be here with you. Thank you for convening this hearing. It's good to be here with Chair Salamanca and alongside Council Member Rivera, whose legislation I also very much support and see uh, to go together with intro 118. Um, as Chair Salamanca mentioned, uh, this pandemic threatens to amplify problems that we already have in our city. Obviously, mass evictions when the eviction moratorium ends, but also, as we saw after the 2008 mortgage crisis, a crisis like this can lead to massive purchase by private equity funds coming in to buy distressed properties as their values have shrunk, um, and then hold them and speculate with them in a way that does not create affordable housing, that does not benefit our communities, that does not maximize the public interest, but instead maximizes private profit and speculation. Um, by treating housing as a public good rather than a vehicle for profit, we can ensure that all New Yorkers have a home they can, aff uh, can afford. We've got a choice now to allow the cycle of disinvestment, privatization, and displacement to accelerate or to invest in permanently affordable housing that will provide stability for tens of thousands of families in the coming years. The for-profit private sector model of affordable housing that we have pursued has not succeeded in serving those who need affordable housing the most, and in too many cases has accelerated gentrification and displacement. So I strongly support uh, Council Member Rivera's legislation that she'll talk about, um, and I hope members will join in supporting Intro 118A to establish a New York City land bank that would enable the city to acquire distressed properties or assets rather than having them acquired by vulture or private equity funds and then put them to public purpose. One simple example is the hotel, distressed hotel stock that's out there today. We know that a lot of hotels are gonna close um, and that as we come out of the pandemic, we are not gonna need uh, a right away the full hotel stock that we have had rather than to let those be purchased up and who knows what will happen to them through speculative ownership. Let's create a land bank, have the city acquire them, and then the city can dispose those buildings to nonprofit supportive housing, affordable housing developers, and community land trusts like we'll be learning about today to create a permanent resource of community controlled, democratic, permanently affordable housing uh, for the future of our city. Thank you for convening this hearing. I look forward to hearing from the great set of advocates who are here to testify. Uh, thank you, Council Member Lander. We'll now hear an opening statement from Council Member Rivera on sponsored intro number 1977. Good afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair Cornegie, for welcoming me to speak at today's hearing on community land trusts and land banks in support of my bill, intro 1977, the Community Opportunity to Purchase Act or COPA. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> and, and just for the record, in the, in the real world, the court would take a recess so that you could attend to your beautiful pet. Thank you for acknowledging his beauty. <laughs> so thank you for that brief um, pause. 
So thank you again for welcoming me to speak at today's hearing on community land trusts and land banks in support of my bill intro 1977, the Community Opportunity to Purchase Act or COPA. COPA would give nonprofit affordable housing developers, community land trusts, and other organizations a right of first refusal whenever landlords decide to sell apartment buildings or property, leveling the playing fields for these community-based organizations in the hyper-competitive New York real estate market. I view this bill as such a high priority for this council because we are today at an important crossroads for the future of affordable housing in New York City. Recent estimates show that New York tenants owe over $1 billion in unpaid rent as the COVID-19 pandemic has continued to rage. We're poised to be dealing with an unprecedented eviction crisis later this year, one the likes our city has never seen before. At the same time, this chaotic market has proven to be an opportune time for private equity and real estate firms to swoop in on cheaper properties with record low interest rates. We've seen this happen before. After the Great Recession in 2008, spurred on by government tax breaks, private equity and hedge funds spent $36 billion to purchase more than 200,000 foreclosed homes across the US. The buyers converted so many into market rate investor owned rental properties that they markedly decreased the country's home ownership rate. We can't sit by and do nothing this time. We have to build a better future for New York City where affordable housing in all shapes and sizes remains possible. COPA will aid in that by giving nonprofit affordable housing developers, community land trusts, and other organizations the critical time and flexibility they need to put together the financing needed to make a fair market offer on these properties. That can be critical in a market where properties can change hands, sometimes in a matter of days. And to be clear, any seller in this case can still consider other offers and is well within their right to reject an offer that is below market rate. This is simply about giving affordable housing producers a fair shot. The timeline COPA creates provides transparency into the real estate market that is essential to giving qualified community organizations time to prepare their bid, include identifying their development partners, contractors, and prospective property managers that they will work with to make this development a success. Think about the massive improvements these organizations could make in efficiency and planning by simply knowing about the full range of properties available and having the guarantee that they will be considered just as seriously by a seller as a market rate real estate developer would be. This is not some new idea. Cities like Washington DC and San Francisco have had forms of COPA on the books for years now, and the legislation has not interrupted the real estate market in either city. What it has allowed is for numerous affordable housing projects to move forward that otherwise might not have without COPA. Bold policy like this is not a silver bullet. The legislation will only be as effective as we wish if our city is willing to invest the financial resources needed to support it. And as we embark on the new budget season, it is imperative that investments are made in community-led development to codify housing as a human right. Critics have argued that vesting HPD with oversight in the process will create more bureaucratic red tape to real estate transactions. This argument is a critique of the budget, not the bill. Within our city's infrastructure, we have the talent and quite frankly, decades of experience in managing affordable housing transactions with the very individuals who are opposed to COPA. And HPD will be able to facilitate these transactions using this expertise as long as the budget provides them the resources necessary to do so. Some of these individuals in opposition might even go as far to say that nonprofit entities mentioned in this bill are not fully able to compete and will ask, isn't there that they are fully able to compete? And they're going to ask, isn't there a better way to enable them to compete in our hyper competitive market? I have a different opinion, but I'm also here to listen. I'm here to consider complementary solutions hear comments on the timelines in regards to the language in the bill, and most of all to discuss how we can work together knowing that so many on both sides will agree wholeheartedly with the spirit of this legislation. But please let me be the first to say, this is not the only solution to our housing crisis. Our fully envisioned citywide CLT plan is one of many facets of what must be a robust platform. We must pass this bill to protect those in affordable housing and provide them with an equal shot 
to both improve upon and continue their community development. I implore you, my colleagues in the council, to join me in supporting the Community Opportunity to Purchase Act, COPA, to defend the pillars of a fair community and affordable housing plan for New York City. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Was, was that a turtle in the background? That's the fastest turtle I've ever seen in my life. Is that what kind of hybrid turtle is that? We'll talk offline about that. But that's we'll offline. That's a that's a New York City turtle right there. Bought on house yeah. in Ridge 29 years ago. Apparently, okay. Uh, yeah. We'll now hear an opening statement from Council Member Holden, which I will actually read in his absence. Um, it is printed, however, in millennial font. So please bear with me as I try to get through this tiny print. Thank you, Council Member Robert Carnegie, Chair of the New York City Council Committee on Housing and Buildings, for giving the opportunity to make a statement on my bill, Intro 2044, at today's hearing. I apologize that I cannot be there myself to make the statement as the timing of this hearing conflicts with one that I'm overseeing as Chair of the Committee on Technology. The novel coronavirus pandemic has inflicted much suffering on the lives of millions of people worldwide. It has caused the death of countless loved ones and, the, and crippled our economy. Our small businesses bear the brunt of an economic crisis precipitated by one of the deadliest viruses in decades. The New York City Council continues to act on behalf of 8.6 million New Yorkers who truly need all the help they can get. My bill, Intro 2044, would be another step taken by a legislative body filled with public servants who aspire to help their constituents in any way they can. On January 9, 2019, nearly two years to the day, we as a body passed former council member Raphael Espinal's bill intro 728, known as the Awnings Act. It provided relief to small businesses throughout the city who received thousands of dollars in fines from New York City Department of Buildings for signs or awnings that they had up for decades. During this pandemic, small businesses had no choice but to look at cost-saving measures to survive. Due to the bureaucracy of government, many of them were unable to navigate through the maze of red tape to finally comply with the laws and ensure their signs or awnings were legal. The measure of the Awnings Act passed in 2019 were not fully utilized and is set to expire. Intro 2044 would further extend on those measures to give small business owners more time to comply with the law. Our small business need relief. I believe this bill would give them that relief. As we begin to recover and bring the economy back to the state it once was in, thank you, Council Member Cornegy, for the opportunity to offer this statement that was on behalf of Bob Holden, Intro 2044. Uh, thank you. So I believe that we're going to move to our first panel. Uh, yes, I have a few which, which, Yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you so much. I'm sorry. No worries. <laughs> Before that was, that was, it, was, it was an incredibly awkward silence in, in there. So I, I didn't know what to do. Right. Uh, before we move on, I want to acknowledge we've also been joined by council members Inez Barron, Dharma Diaz, and Bill Perkins. I'm Austin Brandford. I'm counsel to the Council's Committee on Housing and Buildings. Before we start, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I'll call on you in order that you've raised your hand. We'll be limiting council member questions to three minutes, including responses. We'll first be hearing testimony from the administration, which will be followed by testimony from the public. Today, we will hear from the Department of Housing Preservation and Development, represented by Associate Commissioner Kim Darga. We'll also be hearing from the Department of Buildings, represented by Commissioner Melanie LaRocca. I will now administer the oath. After administering the oath, I will call on you each separately to affirm for the record. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee? and to respond honestly to council member questions. We'll start with Kim Darga. I do. Great. Commissioner LaRocca? Yes. Great. May I begin? Oh, with wait, wait, Austin, uh, before yeah. you go forward, I didn't see a request from council member Diaz to uh, have an opening statement on her bill. Is that correct? I know this is either her first, second, or third bill. Um, did she have an opening statement on her bill? We didn't receive a request yet. Um, OK. Not right. putting it in the spot. OK. Sorry, Dharma. Okay, we can follow up too. Um, but HPD, you can begin when ready. Unmute. A lot of buttons to push on mute there. Um, good afternoon, Chair Carnegie and members of the New York City Council Committee on Housing and Billings. My name is Kim Darga, and I'm the 
Associate Commissioner of Preservation with the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on this important and timely conversation on community land trusts, land banks, and intros 118 and 1977. As the city works to rebuild from the COVID-19 crisis, affordable housing has never been more important to ensure the health and stability of New Yorkers and their communities. Finding and keeping safe, affordable housing is one of the biggest concerns that New Yorkers face, and COVID-19 has only made that need more urgent. Even in this time of hardship, the city has continued to advance its robust pipeline of affordable housing that we know will be critical to stabilizing New Yorkers and their communities. At the height of the crisis, the city continued to advance the administration's ambitious housing plan with a sharpened focus on the most vulnerable New Yorkers and on achieving greater racial equality and inclusion. The restoration of capital in the preliminary plan, we remain on track to continue producing record-breaking numbers of affordable housing this fiscal year. And that is in no small part thanks to the leadership of Chairman Cornegy and all of you here today. We very much look forward to working with the council to ensure we have the tools we need to protect New Yorkers who continue to face significant instability and to support an equitable recovery. HPD is deeply committed to supporting nonprofits, community-based organizations, and mission-driven organizations in acquiring, developing, and stabilizing properties to protect tenants and ensure the long-term provision of affordable housing. The agency works to do this in numerous ways. First, HPD, sorry, first, as HPD aggressively works to develop its remaining public sites that are suitable for residential use, we have introduced several critical reforms to give greater weight to proposals that involve nonprofit developers. We are also very focused on increasing opportunities for MWBE developers who often have deep ties to the communities we serve but remain underrepresented in the industry. Through our efforts to increase participation by MWBE and nonprofit developers, roughly 80% of projects on city-owned sites designated under this administration include an MWBE or nonprofit. But that does not necessarily translate into meaningful financial or ownership stake, which is why this November, the city announced a new requirement that, all MW, that an MWBE or nonprofit partner must hold at minimum a 25% ownership stake, as well as a 25% financial interest in any affordable housing project on public land awarded through HPD. At the same time, the agency has a broad range of tools and programs to support mission-driven buyers looking to acquire private sites to create and preserve even more affordable housing. One of the tools is the New York City Acquisition Fund, a partnership with Enterprise, the Local Initiative Support Corporation, LISC, and a collection of public, private, and philanthropic partners that has generated 13,700 newly constructed or preserved affordable homes since its launch in 2006. This $210 million public-private affordable housing loan fund offers flexible bridge loans to affordable housing developers to acquire vacant sites and occupied buildings and finance pre-development work, allowing owners to hold the property for a period of time but with a clear path to affordability. Nonprofit and MWBE purchasers are eligible for lower interest rates and otherwise better loan terms from the New York City Acquisition Fund. Affordable housing needs of our city are sufficiently great that we need a deep and wide bench of organizations engaged in this important work. And through Housing New York 2.0, we launched the Neighborhood Pillars Program to help preservation purchasers, particularly nonprofit entities, at each stage of the process of acquiring and rehabilitating existing rent stabilized and unregulated buildings to stabilize buildings, protect current tenants, and preserve affordability in neighborhoods across the city. Today, we've acquired 429 homes through Pillars, and we've closed on financing for 370 of those homes so far. We see this along with other preservation programs as a potential tool in the economic recovery ahead. We're always looking at new ways to expand and preserve affordable housing opportunities and bring new partners to the table to accomplish these goals, which is why we have been working to expand and strengthen CLTs across the city. For the last several years, HP has supported CLTs through capacity building as well as through financial assistance for CLT projects. In 2017, 
HP released the CLT request for expressions of interest, or FEI, to learn what ideas local organizations had about how CLTs could be effective in New York City and to identify qualified groups to form new CLTs. The RFEI was pending. The city applied to and won a grant from Enterprise Community Partners, a national nonprofit with strong roots in New York City, to fund the growth of three existing CLT groups and to create a learning exchange to build capacity among new CLT groups. The learning exchange drew upon the expertise of the New York City Community Land Initiative and the New Economy Project to support nine additional community-based organizations interested in forming CLTs. The grant helped to fund operations and startup support while the CLTs worked to identify sites for acquisition. HPD is also now administering additional financial support from the city council to assist these CLT groups as they continue to establish themselves. All of this work culminated in HPD and the CLT movement achieving several major milestones in 2020. In March, HPD provided rehabilitation financing and a new Article 11 tax exemption to enable the ongoing affordability and operations of Cooper Square CLT's cooperative, the only successful, successfully operating CLT in New York City before this year. HPD's assistance will help ensure the long-term affordability of over 300 units of housing in Manhattan's East Village neighborhood. In November, the East Harlem El Barrio CLT became the city's newest CLT when HPD conveyed four buildings to the organization and provided much needed rehabilitation financing. The buildings comprise 36 units of housing that would be operated as an affordable mutual housing association rental project providing a template for the creation of new CLT projects that HPD can now refine. Also this past fall, the Interborough CLT acquired its first site and is poised to acquire several more in the coming months. Interborough is a coalition of nonprofit affordable housing groups working to establish a citywide CLT, focusing initially on neighborhoods in East Brooklyn, the South Bronx and Southeast Queens. In addition to the private sites Interborough is pursuing it's also working with HPD on the pre-development of several affordable housing projects on city-owned land. Of additional CLT organizations also continue to make strides as they work to incorporate, establish governance structures, acquire land or buildings, and secure development financing. Many of these groups were incubated through the learning exchange and are currently supported by the New York City Community Land Initiative Nicely, a coalition of CLTs and advocates, as well as HPD's new director of CLT initiatives, who the agency hired last September. We hope to draw upon all of this progress within the CLT community as we seek to further partner with CLTs on the development of city owned land. In December of 2020, we released the Stapleton Site A request for proposals for a large city owned site on the North Shore of Staten Island. This is HPD's first RFP to include a preference for proposals that incorporate a CLT model. The agency is excited to begin reviewing responses to this RFP in March. Additionally, HPD is working on issuing a request for expressions of interest, um, FBI for groups to establish the presence of a CLT in Edgemere, Queens. It is our goal to eventually convey city-owned land in Edgemere to this CLT for the purpose of creating climate resilient affordable housing and open space in accordance with HPD's resilient Edgemere community plan. As we continue to further the use of the CLT model of providing affordable housing, it is important to highlight that par partnering with CLTs is just one method of many that we use to ensure long-term affordability. The city also has many regulatory and financing mechanisms to accomplish the same long-term affordability goals as we partner with other kinds of nonprofits and affordable housing developers, and CLTs will rely on the same public subsidies as other forms of housing to serve New Yorkers in need of affordable places to live. We look forward to continuing to work to expand the capacity of CLTs to become active partners in creating and preserving affordable housing. 118A would establish a land bank for New York City, which would uh, be tasked with acquiring warehousing and transferring real property to develop, rehabilitate, and preserve affordable housing, among other uses. 
While we are always open to exploring ways to expand availability of land and buildings for affordable housing, we have some concerns that a new entity would likely share many of the same challenges that we currently face. It may lay our additional time and complexity onto the process of land disposition, as well as add cost and responsibility of long-term property management. This is fortunate to have infrastructure in place already, unlike a lot of other cities where land bank model works to fulfill to fill in the gap. There's also concern that this model, which assumes government participation, could distort the market and possibly drive up the cost of acquisition, undermining the intended goals of greater affordability and efficiency. 1977 would give qualified entities a first opportunity to submit an offer to purchase certain residential buildings when offered for sale. If appropriately targeted and well tailored for a housing market, we think a COPA could be an effective mechanism for stabilizing buildings with responsible mission driven owners and a good complement to the city's other tools and programs, such as neighborhood pillars. The critical issue remains funding sources which are especially constrained in the current fiscal environment. We would be interested, however, in working together to properly define the universe of buildings for which COPA would be most productive and effective. There's a concern that any measure that slows down the sales process may distort the market and advantage ownership entities most able to hold property for longer periods of time, which could be counter toward our goals. We also have to be careful to learn from the experiences of other cities, including Washington DC and San Francisco. We absolutely share the goals of doing more to support mission-driven organizations, nonprofits and MWBEs and up the affordability of our communities. And we look forward to working with the council on finding cost-effective acquisition strategies and other ideas that we are hearing from our advocate partners further in the weeks and months to come. Thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. Um, I'd also like to add a brief statement about the uh, pre-considered introduction being heard today on the city's basement apartment conversion pilot program. This is a demonstration program to facilitate the renovation and creation of apartments and basements and cellars of certain one and two family dwellings in Brooklyn Community Board 5. Uh, the pilot reflects the efforts of a two-year interagency working group and joint recognition between the city council and administration that innovative tools are needed to address the city's affordable housing crisis. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic has made compliance with the construction document deadline of Local Law 49 of 2019 difficult for homeowners. This bill would extend deadlines for six months after this local law is enacted to allow homeowners in the program additional time to submit the construction documents to DOB. The in-person inspections and site visits necessary for completion of these documents were delayed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So an uh, extension is required to allow applicants sufficient time to submit their construction documentation. The submission date for the final report required by law would also be extended by six months, the same length and time to account for this delay so that adequate time is available to gather information for the report. I'd also like to thank the bill sponsor, council member Dharma Diaz for her partnership. We look forward to working with you and your constituents on this important program. Thank you very much and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Carnegie and members of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. I'm Melanie LaRocca, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Buildings. I'm pleased to be here to discuss Intro 2044, a bill that would provide much needed relief to New York City's small businesses. Now more than ever, we need to support our small businesses and this bill does just that by extending the, mor uh, the moratorium on the issuance of violations for business signs established by Local Law 28 of 2019. We proudly support this common sense legislation and look forward to working with this committee to make it easier and more affordable for businesses to bring their signs into compliance with applicable regulations. Business signs must comply with requirements in both the New York City Building Code and the New York City Zoning Resolution. The re Regulations in the building code address permitting and structural issues 
and the regulations in the zoning resolution address issues, including permissible surface area projection and height. Collectively, these regulations exist to protect the public from dangerous or illegal, uh, illegally installed signs and to reduce visual clutter. We have taken the existing moratorium as an opportunity to focus on educating businesses about sign regulations. We have sent letters to businesses who have received violations from the department for illegally installed signs in the past, accompanied by information about sign regulations and Local Law 28. Our community engagement unit has also visited businesses door to door in every borough to share this information in multiple languages. While educating businesses about existing regulations is critical, we believe more can be done to support businesses. Last summer, for the first time, we launched an annual no penalty sign inspection program, which allowed businesses to request an inspection from the department to determine if their sign complies with applicable regulations by calling 311. This type of compliance inspection helps businesses avoid unnecessary violations and penalties. Local Law 28 also established a 17 member task force, which included stakeholders representing the New York City Department of Small Business Services, uh, Department of City Planning, community organizations, small business owners, and business advocates. The task force evaluated existing sign regulations and the issues businesses face in complying with these regulations. Uh, and they in turn issued a report last month, which includes recommendations to further support business owners. These include streamlining the sign uh, permit process, updating sign resources available through the department's website, issuing warnings instead of violations when the department finds signs that are not in compliance with applicable regulations to provide businesses with the time to bring their signs into compliance and assigning sign application liaisons in each of the boroughs of the department's borough offices. We are working diligently to implement these recommendations. And we look forward to working with this committee to implement the task force's recommendations that require changes to the law, which include expanding the universe of individuals who may install business signs and extending the current moratorium to provide businesses with more time to bring their signs into compliance. We've heard from businesses that the current pool of licensed sign hangers who may install business signs is limited, which adds to the time it takes and the cost associated with installing a sign. Therefore, the department agrees with this recommendation. We also agree with extending the current moratorium, which expires this month to provide businesses with additional relief. And with that, I thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today, and I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you. Uh, we'll now turn it over to questions from Chair Cornegie. As a reminder, so much, if council members have a question, just raise, use the Zoom raise hand function, we'll call on you in order. Thank you, Austin. Uh, thank you both commissioners, it's great to see you. Um, I wanna begin my line of questioning by having a little context uh, to the bills. Um, it's been brought to my attention that at least one of the bill, well, first of all, all the bills on face value uh, seem like great bills and I wanna thank the bill sponsors. Um, however, uh, at least one of the bills um, from my chair of MWBE hat uh, could be unchecked, if unchecked, could disproportionately negatively impact the ability for some MWBEs uh, to actually access the contracts um, that are associated with um, with um, the bills. So for example, um, there's, there's uh, very few uh, black owned and operated nonprofits that would have the capacity uh, to be able to do what's necessary to get those contracts. Um, so I just wanna make sure that we begin to look at that. And I'd like to work with the bill sponsors to make sure that inadvert there's no inadvertent um, uh, disproportionate uh, difficulty for MWBEs in any of the bills. It doesn't seem that it's apparent at face value, but I have gotten several calls from members of the development community that are MWBE about the potential for them to be excluded um, if these bills are enacted. So it is my intention uh, to now ask the questions that they were prescribed to me, but also to set the context that sometimes in the council in particular, while we're doing a great thing, on one hand, disproportionately negatively impact and separate opportunity for uh, a particular demographic. I wanna make sure 
that that opportunity doesn't happen here and that I work with the bill sponsors to ensure that that's not the case. Uh, so with that being said, I'd like to go to the first round of questions, which uh, uh, remain solely about community land trust. So for many years, there have been multiple CLTs in New York City. Have these CLTs pre preserved affordable housing? If so, what's the AMI for those units? And I guess that's to um, Commissioner Garza. Sure, thank you, uh, council member. Um, so we are very excited by the uh, recent work uh, interest in CLTs and work by um, the organizations to establish themselves, particularly as the need for affordable housing in New York City is so great. We really do believe that we need every type of organization um, to be able to work with all types of owners um, to provide as much affordable housing as possible. Um, we have to date, um, there's been one uh, existing CLT in New York City until very recently, and that is Cooper Square CLT, uh, which is in the East Village. And that property uh, or the CLT recently worked with us to secure uh, financing for renovations and to get a new Article 11 tax exemption uh, that was supported by council. So thank you. Um, and that property will be affordable to households earning up to 80% of area median income. Um, more recently in November, um, so even during a pandemic, we, will, we were actually still working with our partners to create more housing opportunities. Um, in November, we were able to close uh, on to convey four buildings to East Harlem El Barrio CLT, um, which is in Harlem. And those buildings will be affordable from 35% AMI to 100% of area median income. Um, those are the two currently functional operating CLTs in New York City. Um, there's uh, a number of other organizations that are interested in um, acquiring property but uh, have not yet done so. So they're working on establishing governance structures um, making sure uh, the entity or the individuals involved are trained um, and looking at potential opportunities. We do, that being said, we have approximately a thousand units that are currently in pre development with uh, a range of different CLTs across the five boroughs of New York City. Uh, thank you. That's, that's incredibly helpful. The Cooper Square CLT, how many units in total? Um, the, the, sorry, I was, on, I was muted again. Um, the, the Cooper Square CLT is 327 units. And is there um, an aggressive goal uh, for 2021, 2022, 2023 uh, to build out more CLTs? Um, absolutely. So since, so CLTs in New York City, I, I will just preface by saying are a, still a relatively untested model. So we're learning a lot. And I say we in the grand sense, um, are the partners that we're working with, um, the, as well as the, um, the staff at HP, um, we are trying to make sure we understand the model, that we understand understand how it would work for all types of property, including small homes, um, cooperative housing, as well as rental housing. So the East Harlem El Barrio uh, CLT, for example, was a rental mutual housing association. Cooper Square is a, um, a limited equity cooperative. So there are different types of housing that this model potentially can apply to. Um, so since 2016, we've been very fortunate, um, and I think our partners that are interested in this model as well, been fortunate to access uh, funding through enterprise, through city council, among others, to increase the capacity and knowledge base that we're working from. And um, as I mentioned, we have two now operating CLTs in New York City, but we have uh, approximately 1,000 units of housing in the pipeline. Um, and that's, um, that does not include uh, recent um, initiatives, for example, like adding a preference for CLTs in the Stapleton RFP that was released uh, late last year, 
um, that is actual projects through programs like Open Door, um, like our preservation programs, et cetera. So oh, thank you. Once again, that's, that's incredibly helpful. Um, my next question was going to be ar around the impact of CLTs, but since it's relatively new, I won't ask that question. I will ask what's the intended impact of CLTs. And uh, myself and several of my state colleagues have been working very diligently to try to create a new um, Michelama 2.0. Uh, and, and I see some of the remnants of what, what my proposal is for uh, and my colleague's proposal is for Michelama 2.0 in the CLT model. Do you feel similarly, similarly about the potential for that being, you know, and I hate to use, it's just that the Michelama program, we haven't created another unit, a new unit of affordable housing there since 1979 or something, right? So that's a model that certainly need to be, needs to be improved on. Can we improve on that model through the CLT model, I guess is my question. Uh, thank you, Councilmember. That's an interesting question. So I think of uh, the impact of CLTs as a, um, in two ways. First, as I mentioned earlier, and I think we're all aware, um, the need for affordable housing is immense in New York City. And um, from my perspective, that really means that we need to, we need to be able to work with all types of different organizations and partners to be able to accomplish the goal of making affordable uh, housing more affordable. That includes everybody from single family homeowners where we're trying to make sure that they can remain in their homes to um, working with our nonprofit partners, to our for-profit partners. And I think newly CLTs, um, which are nonprofit entities um, so they are largely within that bucket of nonprofit organizations. Um, so, but I think what is unique there is that they're, we're bringing new entities to the table. So um, I think I mentioned in the testimony that some of the initial funding that Enterprise provided uh, was uh, created a learning exchange. There were uh, nine organizations, new and often, uh, in, in many cases, new organizations that were selected to participate in that capacity building and learning exercise that is ongoing. And that means there are more organizations that were not participating in this work necessarily that will be newly doing so. And I think that's really important. So I think first, I think that is a significant impact. Um, I think second, and, and just, I want to quickly go back to a, um, a comment that you made initially, council member, which is that um, just I see CLT as an important partner, but we do need many of the other types of organizations as well. MWBEs are for profit uh, development entities, are existing nonprofits in New York City to be able to accomplish um, our work. Um, second of all, I think CLTs do provide a new model of housing. Um, and we are very interested in exploring new ways that we can ensure the viability and long-term affordability of housing in the city. Um, this is something that I've, I've dedicated many years to now. Um, and I do think, you know, while it's a relatively untested model, it does have potential to do that. Um, some of the things that we are still working through and why it's taken some time to get to the point of actually um, helping the CLTs acquire sites is that we want to make sure that those governance structures and the regulatory structures are, are ready and they will be successful long term. Um, there was another CLT in New York City um, that unfortunately has not been operative um, or successful. Uh, the CLT um, board does not really exist anymore, and that's made it harder for those properties to remain stable. Um, so if it is successful, it does have the potential in separating the land and the stewardship of the land from the use of the building with um, the ability to create long-term stable and affordable housing. Um, and that's something we're very interested in, but I think we all have some work still um, to figure out how we can successfully do that. Um, and I think finally, you know, we are, um, like you, very interested in trying to figure out how we can create new models, whether it's CLTs or looking at the Mitchell-Lama program 
um, to make sure that um, we can provide access, access to different types of affordable housing, whether it be home ownership or rental housing across the city. Thank you so much. And then my last question for this round is equally as complex, of course. Um, we as a city for decades have attempted to create affordability, but it's always been regulated to particular communities. I see the CLT model as an opportunity to, to get affordability in every corner of the city of New York. I think it's incredibly important to do that, to really expound on our rich diversity by making sure that every place has everybody, right? Um, uh, we haven't been able to accomplish that in any real way uh, in this city's history. Um, and as we move forward and we pivot and shift and recovery and resiliency, this is an excellent opportunity through new models to begin to look at affordability in every corner so that this city can be as rich in diversity as it claims to be. Um, I'm wondering if you see the CLT model uh, as a vehicle for doing that. I certainly, in my mind, I believe that as we pivot and shift and move to new ways of creating affordability, that also has to include every single corner of this city if we wanna be as vibrant and meet the mission and vision, especially of the city council, who's made this a real priority, but hasn't been able to chip away at it at a, in any real way. So I know this is, is, is it's a new program, unproven, but anywhere I see opportunity to create diversity in our housing stock and in affordability, I'm, 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 you know, I'm gonna take that opportunity. And, and certainly I see that here, potentially. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, council member. Um, you know, we, we agree. We think this has, this is a model that has real potential, I think, um, for all types of different housing and it can, um, hopefully be inclusive of different types of communities in a new way across the city. Um, you know, we certainly at HPD have been working to create different types of home ownership, both, you know, in the single family home ownership to preserve it as well as cooperatives and rental housing. And I think um, this, the CLT model layered with the work that we have done um, around um, single family homes and co-ops and rental housings by bringing in community members to be part of um, the long-term governance, I think has real potential. Um, and we look forward with conti to continue to work with uh, city council and the various organizations that have raised their hand and expressed interest um, to, um, to hopefully explore how this model can be impactful going forward. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. That ends my round of questionings for the first round. I'd love for my colleagues to also who have actually raised their hand uh, to be able to ask questions as well. So thank you. Great. We'll first be hearing from Councilmember Salamanca, followed by Councilmember Rosenthal. Thank you, Council. Thank you, uh, Ms. Uh, Chair Cornegy, uh, for hosting this hearing. Um, uh, hi, Commissioners. It's great to see you. Um, for uh, a few questions, for the community organizations listening to your testimony, what are the qualifications to be considered for a CLT? Sorry, took me a moment to unmute myself there. Uh, thank you, Council Member. So um, there have been a, approximately a dozen organizations um, uh, made up of different type of members, um, um, entities that have been involved in community organization, tenant organization, development work across New York City that have raised their hands and said, we are interested in this housing model and we would like to figure out how this can work. And we would eventually like to be able to acquire sites for the purpose of affordable housing. Um, development or preservation. Um, so I think interest is certainly number one priority. Um, these organizations, um, at least nine of them, have um, worked with the Learning Exchange, which was um, funded by Enterprise back in 2016, from about 2016 to 2018 to um, build capacity of the, those member groups. Um, that included everything from um, understanding like basic governance structures, what it takes to make an organization successful long-term, understanding affordable housing programs, regulatory requirements, um, the full breadth, 
basically of what is necessary to be a successful owner of affordable housing in New York City. Um, so I think certainly that basic knowledge base is there. Um, in terms of what would it take to translate that knowledge base into practice, um, some of these organizations haven't owned property yet. And that is a significant change in terms of their relationship um, with property. And normally in RFPs and RFQs, I'm just gonna answer in terms of this perspective for a moment and then come back to the larger question. Normally we would look if we were qualifying an organization for let's say a city owned site um, or a building, we would look for experience in owning and developing property over time. So that is certainly a barrier that these organizations are going to have to um, be able to address and I think one way to do that certainly is to begin partnering with organizations that have had that track record, that, have, that are successful in owning and operating property in New York City. Um, so they may have to partner to start with. There are some CLTs in New York City that have that experience. And so they certainly today could probably successfully um, apply for RFPs, RFQs, um, and, um, and that's for the city owned sites, but also, for example, we have a preservation buyers RFQ that is, uh, allows rolling applications. Those organizations could certainly submit an application to that, um, um, RFQ and, um, uh, potentially qualify to become, um, owners of existing buildings, um, through one of our programs. So, I'm not sure if that completely answers your program, but uh, your question, but hopefully that is some helpful context. No, no, it does. It does. Um, in preparing for this hearing, um, you know, we were looking at the challenges of, of CLTs. And I was kind of hoping you can speak to a little bit about what are the challenges of creating CLTs on vacant lots versus uh, residential buildings that already exist? Hmm. So I think it gets back a little bit to what we were talking about a moment ago, uh, where, you know, there are certainly there are, you know, Cooper Square has owned property for some time um, in, um, you know, Interborough is made up of, um, which is Interborough COT, which acquired a single family home back um, late in 2020. Um, is made up of four organizations that have a real track record of owning um, and managing housing in New York City. I think the main barrier, whether we're talking about developing sites or um, purchasing a building and operating it successfully, is it's theoretical knowledge until you put it into practice, until you actually own and manage a site and are working with people to run that property successfully long-term. And I think uh, the model that we saw la uh, effectuated last fall with East Harlem El Barrio CLT is useful um, in this context. Um, that project is made up of um, uh, community members, tenants that are involved in the CLT, but also involved uh, nonprofit organizations that have a long track record in New York City um, which um, two nonprofits, Catch and uh, Banana Kelly, and they partnered to work together so that they brought their joint experience and interest and knowledge to bear on making that project possible. But so, was, that a, was that a vacant lot or was it a bu the building already existed? Those were four existing buildings that were partially occupied. So the question is, um, I, I've heard in, in that it, it's much harder to build uh, a CLT on a, on a vacant lot. Um, and I wanted to see with the rezonings that the city um, has, has, has done in the past. And I know that there's two more rezonings that the, the, this administration is trying to move forward before, you know, um, the, this administration's term uh, ends. You have the Gowanus and the Noho um, and Soho. Um, has, has, has HPD been part of conversations with city planning on identifying locations for CLTs in these two rezonings that the administration is you know, is, is trying to move forward with? Uh, thank you, Council Member. Uh, so I'm not 100% sure. So I'd rather check with my colleagues on those conversations and with DCP and get back to you. Um, I can say, however, that we have looked at 
um, creating um, CLTs in communities where there may, may not be one today. And I think that may be some of the challenge, right? Is that if there's not an organization today that's interested in this, is it possible to create a CLT? Um, especially if you're talking about land development and not buildings where there are tenants that might be an interested stakeholder. Um, we have, for example, um, in Edgemir, um, we've um, asked uh, for an expression of interest to create a CLT with the intent there that um, that CLT then would be able to access um, future uh, development parcels um, to create new affordable housing. So that is one potential model um, that we could explore in terms of applicability in other neighborhoods and um, contexts. Is your, is your office involved at all with um, city planning when they're looking into rezoning communities? So uh, I oversee the preservation work at HPD, but my colleagues in our uh, Office of Neighborhood Strategies are deeply involved in those conversations with the Department of City Planning. And so I'm happy to follow up with them to talk about this further and we can get back to you. Okay, all right, that's it. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for allowing me to speak and ask questions. Thank you, Council Member. Thanks. We will now hear from Council Member Rosenthal, followed by Council Member Rivera. Time starts now. Thank you, Chairs, for holding this incredibly important hearing and commissioner uh, commissioners. Thank you both very much for your work in supporting CLTs. Um, I guess uh, you went through this a uh, little bit. I couldn't quite keep up with the notes. Um, so I, I'm just wanting to know your, your strategic plan to or roadmap to getting to the goal of 3,000 CLTs, which was the number I thought the administration was aiming toward and what the AMI, the proposed AMI levels are for each of those. So I heard 327 at Cooper for 80%, a new one for 36 at, I forget, 30%, a thousand more en route. Do you have, even if it's not a route to all 3000, could you provide to the committee um, sort of what your roadmap is to the, you know, the sites, uh, the timeline, the AMIs, and the number of uh, affordable units for each site. Could you, could you provide that? Sure, so let me um, try to summarize what's happened so far, um, council member. So, the, um, so back in basically from 2016 until more very more recently, um, most of our work with CLTs was focused on um, helping the organizations establish themselves, building capacity. Um, there are now approximately a dozen CLTs that uh, exist around New York City, um, and um, they are certainly all exploring opportunities. Um, we were very excited that even um, given the many other things that we have all been focused on in the last year um, uh, with the pandemic that we were able to work with East Harlem El Barrio CLT um, at uh, close um, to acquire those four um, city owned buildings and secure financing for renovations and um, to work with inner borough to acquire the single family home which didn't involve financial assistance from us, but more just organizational. Um, yeah, and just to be clear, I'm not throwing shade on anything. Yeah. I'm sure you're, you're working yeah. as a great, um, but, but if we could actually see that kind of roadmap, that'd be great. And also if you could um, identify where the city be, would be willing to um, help with uh, the CLTs, uh, the, yeah, the CLTs with financing, particularly with capital financing and financing, thank you, to achieve better, lower AMIs. Absolutely, so um, maybe two additional thoughts and, and then we can follow up with more details if, if that makes sense. 
Um, so we do have basically over the last year, we have gotten to the point of now having approximately a thousand units in pre-development, which is, I think, a pretty given that announcement was about a year ago. It's a, it's a good start. Um, and that is in every basically a whole different range of programs at HPD. So it's it basically if you want to think about this as a CLT is a, um, a type of owner right, and type of housing model that can be layered on to basically almost any type of a housing program. So for example, um, it could be used for affordable home ownership, rental or cooperative housing. We finance those things through a range of programs, including like Open Door, um, including the, you know, our ELLA program and new construction including our, any of our preservation programs, our green housing program, um, you know, it, so it can be, it could be any type of housing you can imagine. And I know other people, the chair, you know, the, the sponsor has questions. Uh, mm -hmm. So I don't mean to stay on this too long. If, okay. if you could just, it's sort of a yes, no. Can you send over to the committee a list of those thousand uh, units and just sort of being very clear, you know, where they are, AMI goals, number of units, that would be terrific. Sure. I, didn't, I didn't mean to- I, No, it's okay, sure, okay we can do that. Any of this. That would be very, very helpful if we could just get some real specifics on that, that okay. would be helpful. Great. And, and, just and also where you might be contemplating uh, providing financing, uh, capital financing or expense, whatever. Okay, great. Sure, no problem. Thank you. Thanks. We'll now hear from Councilmember Rivera, followed by Councilmember Lander. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you to the chair. Uh, I guess I want to just go right into questions on intro 1977. And I think you said that COPA could be effective with the appropriate partners along with your neighborhood pillars and that you mentioned it needing funding. I think those were some of the things that you mentioned as well as cost effective innovative strategies. I do agree that this is a bold policy. I do think it's innovative. It has been around, I mean, the idea itself since like the 19th century. But um, I agree that we could see it more heavily utilized throughout the city. So I guess I wanted to ask if intro 1977 were to become law, how many properties offered for sale would be implicated each year? Sure. Thank you, council member. So we did some very preliminary analysis um, and it looks like you know, last year was an unusual year. So I'm going to take that out of the mix. But back 2019, there would have been approximately a thousand properties. Um, and the year before was a higher number, it was about 30% higher. So it is a significant number of properties that would be impacted. And I'm not sure that this came out completely in the testimony, but one of the main concerns we have is how many properties would be impacted. Um, and that um, if the scope is too wide, that it may not make it possible for us all to focus on where there are really good opportunities to stabilize housing, to provide affordability. Um, one of, I think, our concerns is that, you know, we have certainly a, a range of, uh, of uh, affordable housing organizations in New York City that are interested in the work. But if they get thousands of notifications every single year, it's, it's overwhelming. And so one of the things that we may wanna think about is um, which properties really potentially would be um, real opportunities for stabilization, for protections for residents, for um, really protection long-term and think about if there's a way that we can narrow the scope. Um, some of our, you know, we've done some, I know you, um, you mentioned in your opening remarks, a uh, reference to San Francisco and some of the other uh, programs that exist out there. Um, one of the, um, just looking at that program, which has existed the last couple of years, I think one of the challenges there is specifically the scope challenge. 
um, that only like 1% of the properties actually get to the point of, you know, a nonprofit acquiring them. And that's a lot of, of brain damage, a lot of work for a lot of folks to kind of sift through it to get to that. Has the city conducted any analysis on how a right of first refusal could impact real estate prices in the city? And if so, what would be the impact? That's an interesting question. I don't think, we, we certainly haven't gotten to that point yet. We have started to have conversations about this model. I think we acknowledge there's been interest out there um, around the country. And I think certainly we've talked about it in terms of New York. The timelines involved certainly could impact pricing. Um, and so I think that's something where it would also be beneficial to talk with some of um, the affordable housing community in New York City, um, you know, organizations that are involved in acquisition work today, that sell property today, and, and be mindful um, about the impact of, of timing on pricing um, specifically. Um, so I think that's a conversation we would want to follow up with you and others to have uh, in more depth. Well, you know, you mentioned scope and, and, you know, the point of the bill is also to have this, these qualified buyers. So how do you currently determine which entities are considered qualified preservation buyers? What do you look for in entities that are applying? Is it funding? Is it history potential? I know you went over this a little bit in your testimony, but do you think that list should be expanded? In the legislation itself, there's clear criteria for this list of qualifications and, and who would um, eventually be on it. Sure, thank you. That's a good question. Um, so we have had a preservation purchasers RFQ. Um, we actually originally created um, a RFQ like this um, during the last recession um, in relation to the number of buildings that were over leveraged and try to stabilize them and, and make sure we had a list of organizations that were interested. We updated that a few years ago when we launched the Neighborhood Pillars um, program. And that list is made up of a range of different type of organizations. Um, it's for-profits, it's nonprofits, it's MWBEs. Um, we do look at a combination of factors. Um, we look at um, experience in um, developing affordable housing. We look at experience in um, success in operating affordable housing. So how well does the entity's portfolio of affordable housing projects perform? And then we look at financial capacity. Um, and there's different metrics that we've used over the years to, to assess financial capacity. We have been um, slightly more generous in the minimum qualifications for nonprofits than for profits. Um, but that is really important because we want to know that an entity is going to actually be able to not just identify a site, but actually move that project forward. And if there's not financial capacity there, that can be a real limitation. Of course, yeah, definitely. I mean, there is a criteria there for a reason. These are very, very serious affordable housing developers and managers who I think the, it, their work is mission driven. And I think that's what's so important about this initiative. What do you anticipate would be the effects of, of passing something like intro 1977? Um, so I think that gets back to this question of scale. Are we talking, you know, every, um, transaction involving a three plus multifamily property in New York City? Are we talking a more refined um, list of properties? Um, I think if it is, if we could work together to tailor it, it does have the potential to help us identify properties that could really benefit from having a responsible mi mission driven organization own the property. Um, you know, I think about some of the challenges that we faced just in the decade and a half that I've been involved in housing in New York City, and that's everything from, you know, the last recession and properties being over leveraged, um, you know, having extremely strong market a few years ago where so many of us were concerned about loss of affordable housing, and then the reality of the situation that we're facing today where, you know, many owners have struggled 
Uh, tenants have struggled to pay rents, owners have struggled to pay bills, and certainly that could impact what housing quality looks like in the city. And so I think, um, you know, we would welcome a conversation um, with you to think about how we focus, if we were going to move this type of program forward, how we focus it on that type of um, set of priorities and goals, how we stabilize and preserve housing long term. Understood. You know, I, I know you didn't quite say you support it, but it was, um, that's actually a better response than usual that I get from HPV. So I'm going to take it, I'm going to take it for now. And then we can talk about, you know, as I said in my opening statement, I'm here to listen. I'm here for community solutions. So I just wanted to ask a, a couple questions about the CLTs. And you mentioned the goal and thousand units of housing in the pipeline and council member Rosenthal went over some of this. But do you think the city should be making a greater financial investment in community land trusts as part of its affordable housing strategy? That's an interesting question. I think, so we have, CLTs have access to every program that HPD administers, right? I think the challenge thus far, uh, there's been interested in organizations, right? But those organizations don't necessarily have a track record with a couple exceptions, right? Don't have necessarily a track record of owning and managing affordable housing long-term. And so that is, I think the main barrier that we need to overcome today. Um, and so I think that's where um, this is the point in time we would wanna see CLTs partnering with other organizations to establish that track record to get you know to get in there and actually start doing um so i think you know we could certainly i i, I think we would always welcome additional support in terms of capacity building and knowledge and i don't think just because we have 12 CLTs that are potentially interested in New York City that that is the end of the conversation. I think certainly there is room for more organizations to step up and say we are interested or more communities to step up and say we are interested. Um, but I think the main challenges today are around building that actual operation operating capacity. Would you say that CLTs are still a priority for the administration? Sure, absolutely. Absolutely. Has the city looked into the possibility of using CLTs as a way to rehabilitate distressed assets, such as at-risk HDFCs, long-term AEP buildings, properties in the third-party transfer program, and properties in the tax lien sale? And if so, can you provide us an update on these efforts? Um, sure, thank you, council member. That is, that is a huge, that's a huge question. Um, yeah, so we, stabilizing troubled buildings is a big undertaking and we need every type of partner. And I think certainly an organization that is mission driven, that wants to work with tenants long term, um, I think is important to that conversation. Um, I've been really fortunate to um, be engaged in conversations around uh, the third party transfer program um, and really excited that along with uh, Chair Cornegie, who is co-hosting that working group, uh, along with Commissioner Carroll, uh, we are really excited that we'll be having an upcoming session um, after a slight pause from the pandemic. Um, so certainly I think we welcome that conversation in that forum. We also, I've been very fortunate to be able to have recently sat in in some of the stakeholder conversations that City Hall's had with um, different groups around the tax lien sale. Um, and uh, I'm, you know, very interested um, and excited about the conversation hopefully we'll have over the next year as part of the task force around potential involvement of CLTs and stabilizing um, properties, including um, the, the role that some of those organizations may play in helping to do outreach and um, help owners um, access assistance to stabilize outside of acquisition itself. Um, so I do think there is potentially a role. Um, I think, again, the challenge is that this is still a relatively untested model in New York City. And I think 
Um, you know, before we could talk about, you know, CLT stepping in and acquiring a lot of property, we really, we need a ramp. We need, a, we need some more time to help these organizations actually grow their experience and their capacity. Um, and so um, I think there's a lot of worthy conversations out there um, and that is an important part of it. Well, thank you. Thank you for answering my questions. I agree to grow in their capacity. I believe that my bill would also give them an edge to do so. So I hope that you'll consider COPA. Um, I think that there is some proven successful results. You could look at Cooper Square, not only residential, but commercial space that is affordable, that's had long-term businesses in there. Just take a walk along East 4th Street. And um, you know, I, I truly believe that CLTs preserve affordable housing. So um, I'm looking forward to working with you to, to pass this bill and, and to make sure that we are supporting these organizations of which you seem you know, look excited about in terms of the outreach that they can achieve because of the trusted relationships that they've built over years of organizing. So I wanna thank all of them for being here today. I'm sure you'll be listening to their testimony and I wanna thank you for answering my questions and to the chair for giving me the time. Thank you. Thanks. We'll next be hearing from council member Lander and then circle back to chair Coney for any final questions. Thank you very much for the opportunity, As Associate Commissioner. It's good to good to see you. Um, you gave uh, Councilmember Rivera a, a warmer and more open uh, the response to her bill than to mine. So I'll start there and dig in a little bit. Um, you know, what I first heard you say was that the idea of a land bank is duplicative; that we already have mechanisms in place. Um, I want to just use the example of the distressed hotel units to really understand how that would work. Obviously, we have existing opportunities in place for supportive housing groups to seek capital from the city to finance acquisition and rehab for supportive or affordable housing. But that's a long and slow process. You have to design the building and like have a real plan for exactly how you're going to redevelop it, already have secured your subsidy, operating subsidy and service dollars from the state. So the odds that we could move quickly at this moment to acquire any meaningful chunk of distressed hotel stock is not realistic under the current tools that are available, which is exactly what the land bank would be designed to do to make acquisitions, have the city hold property, and then be able to work with folks to dispose it. So um, I just use that as an example. What, what, what am I missing? What do we already have in place that the land bank would be duplicative of? Why would it not be um, a, a really strong tool for something we urgently need right at this moment. Thank you, council member. Um, so I think um, we are absolutely interested in exploring opportunities to help our partners be more success successful in acquiring sites, um, buildings across New York City. I hear you. I, Answer my question, though. I mean, I know you work with supportive housing developers, but that doesn't mean you have a tool to rise rapidly to the moment. Right. So I think the, ch the challenge is a couple. There are a couple big challenges. First, I do think we have really significant concerns about creating an entity that would acquire property where there is not a clear financing strategy with the resources lined up because that could result in a, this new entity or land bank having to hold land longer, land or buildings longer, which means carrying those costs, um, adding costs certainly at the end of the day makes it harder ultimately to achieve, I think the goals that we would share, which well, is- What do you think is gonna happen to the hotels we didn't purchase? you think they're going to become affordable or supportive housing and the, the private sector is going to take care of that? So let's just go with your example. First, I think you've backed off of saying it's duplicative. I don't hear you saying we have a tool to do it. If the land bank acquired it, you're right, there's some risk. It might have to hold it for a while. But units that it acquired, that it might have acquired and held that wouldn't have gotten finance to partners immediately, you think those will become affordable housing in the longer term? Because to me, it's quite clear they'll get scooped up by speculative private equity actors. That's what happened in the last financial crisis. I just see no reason to believe that's not what will happen here. Okay, so let's, let me back up a little bit. So we do have a wealth of resources in New York City. Um, most of our development and preservation work nowadays happens on private sites. Um, 
I think uh, on average, we're talking in the low 90% in terms of the projects that are on private sites versus on public sites nowadays. A lot of those in involve acquisition and we have a range of resources to help uh, interested entities in actually acquiring those sites. But so I asked about this crisis. What entity is going to acquire distressed hotel stock without already having secured long-term operating and service subsidies to make that supportive housing? Right. So we have a range of tools and there are a lot of partners, I think, out there that are potentially interested. I'm not personally um, an expert on the converting hotel to housing model. I know there's a lot of interest in it, and I do believe there's been um, recent hearings on that topic. With some there are, friends. and the answer is that no one's going to do it because until we can secure long-term operating and service subsidies, there's no model that makes it work to acquire them. Anyway, I, it's not duplicative. So that's part one. You said this is duplicative. We don't have a tool for doing that, and this would do it. If we don't want to do it because we'd rather just let the market do what it's going to do with those properties rather than take the risk that the city would have to hold them for a while through the land bank, okay, I, that's that's what I, I think I, I, I heard. I, I guess I... My, the second thing I heard you say, which I really would like you to unpack a little, is that having a land bank through which the city could acquire and hold property for public purpose would distort the market. So, I, I mean, can you spin out a little what you mean by how that would distort the market? Yes. So let me just go back for a second on the, the previous issue. So owning property so a silly a, a city affiliated entity that acquires land that doesn't have a clear financing plan in place to yield the end result means adding costs to the city to hold that property until such time as that how that plan could be effectuated and i think one of our fundamental concerns is that you know we've had more constrained resources recently and we wouldn't want to put the city or a city affiliated entity like a land bank in a position yeah. of the That's why we just fear different things. I, I fear more that the units we don't acquire will be bought up by vulture and private equity funds uh, and will be lost to us forever as a resource for affordable housing. And I would rather use city capital that we borrow for the long term to do more to increase the footprint of supportive and affordable housing to confront the crisis. So I, I respect the fear that that will cost the city money but I think the fear that we will lose the opportunity at scale is just a bigger one. So, and we don't have a tool right now to address it. So creating a land bank wouldn't obligate, it would never obligate the city to purchase. The, the, the city affiliated land bank would decide what to purchase, would have to set fair prices, would have to bargain. It's, it's not gonna be given property. So it's still gonna be a set of transactions. You're gonna have to make a decision on every one, but you could do a thing you can't do today, which is use city capital to buy uh, a chunk of, of hotel rooms that are currently vacant probably help the city economy at the moment. So actually in the long run, you might help spur economic growth and activity and have the, anyway, but but tell me about distorting the market because that was one that like I really, I think it's, yeah. I, I gotta say, I don't think there's any way in which the creation of a land bank that would have the ability to acquire private sites under clear terms and acquisitions and the kinds of rules HPD and its partners set up would in any way distort the market? That just seems to me like the kind of fear that people say when they don't want to do something. But but what's the argument that it really would distort the market? Because I would take that seriously if it were real. Okay, so I do think so. Just fundamentally, we absolutely support trying to do more in terms of affordable housing. I think what we want to make sure we're doing is that we are efficiently using public resources. To Amen. Do that. And every one of the acquisitions okay. the land bank would have to make would have to be underwritten and be, you know, carefully tended to, to make sure that right. it was an efficient use of resources and no one, anyway. Okay. You're not going to let the council decide on what the acquisition is. So you'll still be able to make sure you can make efficient use of the resources. So the moment city says I want property. So we have successful programs in New York City, including the New York City Acquisition Fund, which has um, now existed. Uh, I might need to turn my camera off because my it looks like my internet connection is unstable. One second. Um, that allows entities to acquire sites, including for conversion purposes, to actually create affordable housing. And it's done with a private entity that negotiates that. Our concern is certainly if we then put the city at the face of that negotiation, it puts us at a disadvantage from a pricing and negotiation perspective. 
in addition to the fact that the potential hold time that we're talking about in terms of achieving the end goal, producing the new housing, would potentially be longer, adding costs and thereby also underpinning the goals associated with the program. Okay, I, I mean, I accept that there would be costs associated. So what, what I heard you say in your testimony at first was, it'll distort the market and it's duplicative. I don't hear you backing up either of those things. I hear you saying, it'll cost money um, and, and each deal would need to be carefully underwritten to make sure there wasn't too much exposure. And I actually agree with those things and they would be details you'd wanna work out, but that's not duplicative and it's not distorting the market. So um, anyway, I, I hear that, you know, um, I don't imagine this is gonna actually get stood up between now and the end of the administration, but I, uh, I appreciate the feedback. Um, I wanna go a little more into a couple of things that you said about the, the city's support for the wider variety of nonprofit uh, land trust and, and other social housing actors. Um, could you tell me what percent of, of city subsidy or what percent of city land for new housing production and construction goes to for-profit developers versus the broad category of nonprofit ones? Um, thank you, council member. That is a very tough question to answer. Um, we have for years now, um, I think gotten versions of that question and unfortunately, given the complexity of ownership structures, it's really hard to unpack that. So and no. so, Go ahead. let me let me finish. So um, we are trying to figure out systems where we can better track that. Oftentimes, because there's joint ventures and partnerships, it's it's unclear. We have though recently um, made some changes to our disposition strategy for city-owned land. Um, that um, makes it easier for MWBEs and nonprofits to play a role. So for example, late last year, uh, we made a change to require that every uh, RFP now requires that a MWBE or a nonprofit entity have not just 25%, at least 25% ownership, ownership interest, but also a financial stake in the project. So I'm going to ask you about that in, in one second, but um, I guess, so I just want to, you know, for the record here, the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development has done research looking at disposition and subsidy during the, well, really going back to the Giuliani and Bloomberg, but especially just for these numbers, the de Blasio administration and found that 79% of subsidy for new construction and 76% of land disposed for affordable housing went to for-profit private developers. So essentially 80% of the subsidies to for-profits, 20% to the full universe of nonprofits, including CLTs, but also community development corporations and 76% of the land. So, I mean, I don't think it's that it's that complicated to track. I don't think you wanna track it. Like this administration has not been committed from the beginning. When I came on the scene in, in community development and affordable housing, there was a much larger footprint of nonprofits that got shifted in the Giuliani and Bloomberg administrations, and it has not been shifted back in this administration. It's a it's a policy choice. It's it's not a you know you could defend it, but if you don't even measure it, if you can't even give us an answer, it's hard to believe that there's a commitment to really changing it. So um, on the twenty five percent ownership stake for MWBEs and nonprofits, um, what do you think of the what, what's the purpose of that? What's the what's the point of giving a nonprofit? Let's go with a nonprofit here for a minute, because I understand with an MWBE, their ownership stake is then an equity stake. They'll make some money uh, in the deal. But for a nonprofit, what's the point of having a nonprofit have a 25% ownership stake in a joint venture for a city owned piece of land? So I think we've, you know, there's a lot of folks have asked us why we are not making sure that our nonprofit and MWBE partners have access to the city owned sites. We've taken that ask very seriously. And you know, certainly there are many of our partners that um, where joint venturing is not necessary. They have a deep bench, their own organizational capacity, and certainly may be the sole entity involved in the project. Some of our MWB and nonprofit partners, it makes more sense to partner uh, for a particular project. And so this is a way to make sure that even in those partnerships, there's meaningful stake by that organization. And, and I value that, you know, on, on the public place site, the Gowanus Green team, as you know, has a nonprofit junior partner that I feel very strongly about. And I think that that project is a good, a good one. But 
does 25% stake given on profit decision-making power over what rents will be, what income families will be served, or what to do at the expiration of affordability requirements? So I think it's between the individual partners in a project to work out the relationship they have with that project and the role they're each Imagine one where in exchange for a 25% equity stake, you'd have majority decision-making control over those critical questions? Because I've never seen one like that. So again, this is a, it's a minimum requirement. It's not a maximum. We have many projects that are solely, that solely involve MWBs or nonprofits, but this is a way to ensure that each of our projects involve a MWB or a nonprofit entity in a meaningful manner. And it ultimately would be between those partners to work out the details, but I cannot imagine an organization signing their name to documents if they're not comfortable with the transaction. Well, I mean, okay. I mean there, there's a long different way, a far way between being comfortable with a transaction and having decision-making control over what happens. And I'll, I mean, I'll wrap up here because there's lots of folks planning to testify, but in a funny way, I feel like the 25% stake actually shows the disagreement really well and almost gets it exactly backwards. Like the goal is not to turn nonprofits into 25% equity stakeholders. So they'll get 25% of the gains on sale when a project is sold off. The goal is kind of precisely the opposite to pull housing as much as possible out of the speculative marketplace so that permanent affordability and democratic decision-making are what govern sites, which in this case began as city owned land. So um, on privately owned sites, I can see much more reason, of course, to have private actors in the marketplace acquiring, but where we amidst a housing crisis of long duration, have city owned sites that are already owned by the public, transferring them to the private sector um, and then leaving a little bit of nonprofit ownership so that they could get some of the money made on sale. Anyway, that, that's not the goal of a community land trust. That's not the goal of the strategies that we're talking about here today. It's to achieve more permanently affordable housing in that broader democratic footprint. So I'll just close by saying I virtually am sitting here in front of Penn South, um, uh, which is one of those long standing entities that has a couple of thousand units of cooperative housing. You're right that there's only a few land trusts that are in the market today. But if you look at the bigger universe of CDCs, of nonprofits, of co-ops, of Mitchell Lama co-ops and of land trusts, we have a robust sector of housing that's outside of that for-profit speculative marketplace. And the goal of today's hearing, I think, and the goal of a lot of the strategies we're proposing is to grow it ambitiously, not a thousand units, which is wonderful for the thousand families that gets it, but on the scale that Mitchell Lama co-ops were created on the scale that might actually impact the housing marketplace. So I'm gonna leave it there because I wanna hear from the folks who are doing the work on the ground who have that ambition, but that's the goal of this hearing, um, not just a couple of bills and a few more units, uh, but some meaningful transformation because the what we're doing right now is just not working for so many families and we really need more ambitious strategies to address it. So Chair, I wanna thank you for convening uh, this hearing and, and I look forward to hearing testimony from, from the folks who have come. Thank you. Uh, we'll, circle, we'll circle back to any final questions from Chair Cornegie before moving on to public testimony. Chair Cornegie. Uh, yeah, so no, I, I know that people have waited uh, a little bit of time. Can you hear me? So yeah, yeah. I don't mind moving to, I don't mind moving to, um, to the to the next part of the hearing and hearing from um, public testimony. I, I, I think that um, my colleagues have been uh, very good in asking questions, most of which I was going to ask as well. So um, I'm, I'm good. Thank you. Sounds good. So we'll now be moving forward toward to public testimony. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our in-person council hearings, we'll be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Once your name is called, a member, a member of all st our staff will unmute you, and a sergeant at arms will set the timer and announce that you may begin. I would now like to welcome Robert Altman, followed by Christopher Wadello and Ann Korchak. I'm starts now. Thank you very much, and, and thank you for taking me early. I submit and re submit and written testimony today regarding uh, Intro 1977, which the Queens and Bronx Building Association opposes. And I'd also like to point out that a number of our members are also affordable housing builders, and they're um, opposing that as well, despite that. 
Um, the bill is extremely cumbersome in its process and it does elongate the process of selling. As a result of elongating the process of selling, it will, trust me, it will lead to reduced purchase prices and uncertainty in the marketplace. And when there is uncertainty in the marketplace, prices go down. The problem is that people often want to know that they're dealing with something of their firm and dealing it. And after a while of looking at all your buyers in this type of situation, you're going to actually be able to negotiate something with one person and get a deal done. Uh, if you're constantly going back and forth, as the bill might create with, if a non-for-profit gets involved uh, through the beneficial portions for it, that could be a problem for the transaction. I, I would say that it's not that we have a, anybody has any issues in getting the not-for-profits involved. If the uh, council wanted to pass a bill that would require a, in a sense, a uh, listing service run by HPD, to list all the buildings of the nature that is contemplated within the uh, within the uh, legislation, and that the uh, brokers would be required to put it on there so that nonprofits could know what's on sale at any given time. That's not going to be a problem, and the uh, nonprofit would then have the ability to compete in the marketplace just like everybody else. Um, so that's not necessarily a bad thing. But the situation to put in something there where it's six months here and a couple weeks there and a couple months there, it just spreads it out way too long. I don't think the bill is, is ultimately properly conceived because of that. I'm expired. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Christopher Rodello, followed by Ann Korchak and Athena Burkhoff. I'm Stotch now. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Chris Widello. I'm the Director of External Affairs for NYSAFO. We're the New York State Association for Affordable Housing. And thank you to Chair Carnegie and members of the committee for uh, this hearing and the opportunity to uh, testify. Uh, NYSAFO, we're the Trade Association for New York's Affordable Housing Industry. We have nearly 400 members, um, and we include everyone from developers to lenders, investors, attorneys, and so forth, uh, you know, the contractors and architects. Um, and really anyone that is involved in the, in the financing and construction of affordable housing. Uh, we uh, have opposition to uh, intro 1977. Um, with respect uh, to preserving affordability and stability in residential buildings, it's one of uh, Ny NYSAFA's, um, you know, as part of our mission. And as the affordable housing industry group, um, you know, we work on behalf of all of our members to strengthen funding streams for the preservation of programs to increase supply of affordable housing and to brainstorm with agencies and other advocacy groups around creative new solutions uh, like converting struggling hotel and office space into affordable and supportive housing. While the intent is well-meaning, um, the real world impact uh, should uh, intro 1977 be enacted is very troubling to the affordable housing owners and providers that make up NYSAFA's membership. First, there's a presumption that nonprofit entities are simply by nature of being a 501c3 uh, inherently better stewards of affordable housing or better operators of residential buildings. There are nonprofit owners and operators of residential housing with good track records and with bad track records as it relates to building maintenance, financial management, uh, of the building, repair, responsiveness, and more. And the same is true for uh, for-profit owners. Uh, NYSAVA has both for-profit and non-profit companies in its membership and on our executive committee. Uh, those companies work together in a shared mission to expand affordable housing and make the industry stronger for the benefit of all players. Um, for um, our for-profit affordable housing provider members have viewed uh, with alarm recent council bills that appear to stem from a a perspective that they are problematic when their collective track record, many thousands of units of affordable housing created and preserved suggest otherwise. The practical elements of the bill are also troubling. It's difficult to envision how the real real estate market generally will react to the significant new slowdown in activity and month long freezes on sales that this bill would impose. But a financial crisis is not the time to find out. It's unclear how HPD facing the same difficult budget context as most other city agencies in this environment has the capacity to serve as a bureaucratic overseer of the most uh, of most new sales of residential properties. I think in closing, you know, to be a qualified not-for-profit entity capable of making a bona fide uh, offer for, on residential properties, that number in the many millions of dollars would require significant cash on hand. 
this bill would empower a small number of well-financed citywide nonprofits who might conceivably be in a position to make offers, but the vast majority of 501c3s um, uh, could not. There is a discussion to be had in, about empowering nonprofit capacity, but the scope of this bill is just too vast to benefit um, too few. So uh, thank you uh, very much for your time. Thank you. We'll hear from Ann Korchak, followed by Athena Bernkopf and Leo Goldberg. Time starts now. And you're still muted, just one moment. Oh, okay, I apologize. I thought I was unmuted. Um, I'm speaking today in opposition to the bill, 1977. Uh, my family provides housing for 20 families um, in District 6 uh, for three generations. Uh, legacy ownership buildings like ours, you know, are still family owned and in many cases need to be sold quickly for estate tax purposes or for a family's financial needs. Small properties like ours don't have the resources that a corporate or an institutional owner might have to, uh, you know, navigate a financial crisis. Um, so the requirements of this bill, um, where we would have to wait 120 days for one of these nonprofit entities to tell us, you know, that our building would be one that they would want to purchase, um, you know, really puts building owners like us at a disadvantage. Um, and if we were in the middle of a financial crisis, you know, that extra 120 days is now going to greatly impact the residents of the building. You know, if we were short on, um, you know, funds, you know, could we keep up with the building expenses and utilities and that sort of thing. Um, so I just wanted to, you know, also add that, you know, small property owners like ours, um, you know, have been greatly impacted, obviously, by COVID and also the passage of the housing bill in 2019. Um, you know, we are providing a huge portion of uh, the affordable rent regulated housing stock in the city. And frankly, we need your support. You know, we don't need one more bill that's going to make running our businesses, you know, more difficult. Um, and I, I just had one thought, too, after I heard the um, commissioner from HPD. Uh, speaking about, you know, the parties that are interested uh, potentially in, in, you know, getting involved in these sort of transactions, if they don't have experience, they would need to partner with an experienced entity. And as soon as she said that, that was a red flag to me. I pictured, you know, the project renewal type of organization that's now running the Lucerne. Um, you know, these are slick corporate types. I'm and, excited. you know, I just don't see, you know, the residents of the city, you know, benefiting, you know, from a group like that um, being involved in these transactions. So uh, thanks for your attention. I appreciate the, you know, the opportunity to speak today. Thank you for your testimony. We'll next be hearing from Athena Bernkopf, followed by Leo Goldberg and Ryan Hickey. Time starts now. Athena? You're unmuted, but we can't hear you. Try again. There may be an audio issue. Um, we can move on and you can submit testimony for the record. Or we can, just one moment. Uh, let's move to testimony from Leo Goldberg, followed by Ryan Hickey and Marika Williams. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Carnegie and the Committee on Housing and Buildings for this opportunity to testify. My name is Leo Goldberg. I'm Senior uh, Project Manager at the Center for New York City Neighborhoods. The Center promotes and protects affordable homeownership in New York City and is a member of the Interborough Community Land Trust, which stewards permanently affordable and community-controlled homeownership housing for low-income families in New York. Uh, we are also a member of the New York City Community Land Initiative with a number of other groups that are gonna to testify today. Uh, at the center, we are preparing for a potential wave of foreclosures and mortgage distress this spring as tens of thousands of homeowners leave forbearance plans. And we've also been tracking the huge increase in investor activity in the small home housing stock and the homeownership space generally over the last few years. 
that's cash buyers and flippers targeting small homes, co-ops and condos that typically are owned by owner occupant families. That combination makes it especially important now to put, make sure our low income communities are in a position to own the land and housing uh, in their neighborhoods with safeguards for permanent affordability. Interborough Community Land Trust, as assisted by uh, Assistant Commissioner Darga, recently completed our first pilot acquisition, which was of a home uh, at risk of foreclosure. We've stabilized the home by bringing them onto the Community Land Trust. And we think that that's the kind of project that Community Land Trust can take on as mortgage distress and financial changes continue to sweep through the city during COVID. Uh, both intro 1977 and intro number 118A offer promising paths forward to increase the man, amount of land and housing that we remove from speculative market. Um, in both cases, we ask that the council consider how acquisition and redevelopment financing can be prioritized to make sure that these initiatives are effective. In particular, with the Commun right. Community Opportunity to Purchase Act, acquisition financing has been pointed out by those in support and opposition to the bill is really going to be critical to make sure that the nonprofits that partner with tenants are actually able to make these acquisitions and, and make use of the bill. Um, I'd also like to highlight that on the basement conversion pilot, we strongly support the extended timeline uh, for use of the funds in the pilot. We think that's going to be a critical pilot to show how basement uh, conversions can be legalized across the city and that can be a port, an important part of our affordable housing plan. Uh, so we look forward to working with the council on, uh, we think there's potentially key changes to both the land bank and COPA bills to come. Uh, we wanna explore more uh, what, how the eligibility for COPA and timelines can uh, be tailored to make sure that it's as effective as possible and that we're targeting the right types of buildings. Um, and thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Ryan Hickey, followed by Rick Williams. I am stars now. Good afternoon, everyone. Can uh, everyone hear me? My yes. name is Ryan Hickey, and I'm the project director at the Cooper Square Community Land Trust. Uh, as we've heard, we're the oldest functioning community land trust in the city. We were founded out of the struggle against Robert Moses and the urban renewal plans. And uh, we have 328 affordable residential units on our property, as well as 22 commercial spaces. On average, just to kind of clarify some of the uh, discourse that was previously mentioned, you know, even though our regulatory agreement states that we have an AMI up to 80% of area median income on average, our residential area median income hovers around 30% of AMI. Um, so we're deeply, deeply affordable, probably the most affordable housing potentially in Manhattan. Um, so I'm not gonna go into the landscape that we're currently in. We all know that we are completely at risk of a huge wave and avalanche of foreclosures. Um, you know, real estate investors back in April, 2020 said, and I'm quoting here in the Wall Street Journal, quote, our thoughts and prayers are with all of our fellow Americans and nobody wants to capitalize on anybody's misfortune. But I will tell you, real estate investors, when you take the emotion out of it, many of them have been waiting for this for a decade. So we are on the brink of something completely catastrophic on par with 2008. And if we do not act strongly, swiftly in terms of passing COPA, passing council member Landers land bank bill, we will see a potentially even bigger transfer of wealth and property assets to private equity and real estate firms um, on a scale that we haven't seen yet. So, you know, renditions of COPA have been successfully implemented across this country. For example, in San Francisco, over half a dozen successful transactions have been carried out by local community organizations since the bill's passing in late 2019, preserving community, uh, community organizations preserving affordable housing in a rapidly gentrifying city. Um, it should be said, however, that COPA's success in San Francisco is amplified by the city's existing small sites program, which dedicates funding for acquisition and renovation, which is why it's crucial to actually set aside funding to incubate CLTs and provide set aside funding streams to acquire and preserve properties. Um, and just to kind of put this into pers perspective, you know, we acquired two new buildings at the end of 2019. And this is a going back to some of the questions that folks have asked beforehand. Um, so we have a mix of limited co-ops, we have rental apartments, 
and we have commercial spaces on our properties. Um, we, in that transfer of property, we are preserving not only affordable housing, but tenant controlled housing. So we are doing virtual uh, leadership development, virtual trainings, virtual workshops to move tenants to leaders and leaders to board members. Um, I don't think any other housing model in the city really is trying to do what the NICELY is doing. And of, of course, we are part of the New York City Community Land Initiative. Um, but again, this is why it's so crucial to pass COPA to stave off the worst effects of a potential catastrophic uh, housing collapse in New York City. And you know, I'm, I'm excited to answer any questions people may have of our model um, and to work to pass these two bills. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. And before we move on, we actually want to circle back uh, to Athena Burkhoff to see if we can sort out this audio issue. Let's touch now. Athena? We still can't hear you. I, just as a reminder for anyone, if we have any technical or audio issues, you're all encouraged to submit testimony for the record. You have until three days after the end of the hearing to submit that, and we'll read that. Thank you. So next we'll be going to Barika Williams, followed, followed by Deanira Del Rio and Valeria Orselli. Barika? Time starts now. Um, hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you to Cal um, Chair Cornegie and to the council members of the Housing and Buildings Committee. My name is Barika Williams. I'm the executive director at ANHD, Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development. And most of you all know who we are, so I won't use up my time for that. Um, and if you'll allow me what I'll actually put my time to is more so answering some of the things that have come up in the questions um, as opposed to sort of rehashing anything. Um, so first off to pick up some on where Ryan left off um, with Cooper Square, which is an ANHD member and one of our board members as well, um, is that the fear of a lost opportunity um, for bringing in and converting many of the distressed assets in this moment in time and in this recession is very, very real. Um, uh, ANHD did a bunch of work and trainings around lessons learned um, and things that we wish we had in place, things that we took too long to get in place at, at, um, post the 2008 recession. There is a lot to be learned there that we could be building on in order to be bringing in more units to affordable housing in this moment in time instead of losing things. Um, and the question is, are we going to actually transition and put better policies in place and then match that with funds and resources necessary to be able to actually preserve those units. Um, I want to speak to specifically um, the, the role in place of mission-driven development in this, um, and I think it's important to highlight that it's, it's not the same to there, there are many developers who believe in, invest in their buildings and communities um, who are not mission-driven developers. And, and we do wanna speak to and lift that up. Like the, the, that is a real thing. There are folks who run those buildings in their communities. I'm fortunate enough to live in one. Um, so I, I do think it's important to recognize that. However, the role of mission-driven development, nonprofit developers who are mission-oriented, um, co-ops, uh, um, limited uh, HDFCs, um, uh, land trust, things like this are, is, is very different and unique. They are different stewards and it goes beyond, oh, yeah, it goes beyond buildings and maintenance. Okay. So I'll skip that part. Um, I want to say on the COPA piece, uh, the question of scalings and the concerns that HPD, is that a concern is that HPD would do a one by one piece by piece model. Um, and what we really need to be doing is pushing the city um, to meet the scale of what is possible in the market, not letting the agencies um, appetite and, and um, ability to, to set the scale of what is possible. We really need to be inverting those things. Um, I think uh, the, for Council Member Rivera's question, I think an important thing to lift up is that the current administration has not shown its willingness to stand up for the current challenge for our current right of refusal, let alone an expansion, which is currently under threat um, and legal threat at this time. And the administration hasn't signed on um, to stand with that. Uh, the question of whether or not uh, it would impact the market and distort the market is, with all respect to um, Assistant Commissioner Darger, a little bit of a red herring. Uh, 421A is a $1 billion a year distortion of land values in the real estate market. So that already exists. The market is already distorted. Um, and lastly, uh, if Councilmember Cornegie, if you can ask me about MWBE and nonprofit, I'll be able to answer that. Um, and I will also say that I am one of the few people in this uh, conversation who can speak to COPA as a real thing. I'm originally from the DC area, did the first TOPA deal in Washington, DC in mid 2005. And so actually have the experience of 
tenants purchasing their building from their landlord, which is still a working 102 unit cooperative to this day. Thank you. So th thank you for your testimony, Ms. Williams. I certainly would like to ask you about MWBEs and nonprofits. Thank you. Sorry. Wait, wait, wait. You're, you're muted again. Good. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I think Chair Carnegie, what one of the things that was coming up in that is um, is the distinction between being a minority or women owned entity versus an MWBE. And unfortunately, a and and our are not, we are only nonprofit uh, members, um, owners, developers, and, and advocacy organizations. We run into this constantly. I am very proud that I have a huge part of our a &HD membership that is POC led organizations. Um, however, since they are not for profit entities, they do not qualify as MWBEs. Um, and I think that's an important thing to lift up in a distinction. So folks like Impact and Northwest Bronx and AFI and Chaya and anytime that we set MWBE requirements are actually excluded from being a part of those set asides. Um, and I think that this is important to highlight because so many of our leaders in this area of color um, not exclusively because we do have um, great MWBE partners on the for-profit side, but many of our folks end up in mission-oriented organizations because they want to be a part of this. They want to serve their communities. They do so not just in the development way, but in the mission and community rooted way um, and then run into the fact that they are also then simultaneously excluded from many of the things that focus exclusively on MWBE. So I think that's an important piece to lift up because what we don't want to do is create a dynamic where we're trying to get to POC ownership, stakeholdership, um, and investors um, and controlling interest, and by doing so, unintentionally divert and exclude many of our POC-led nonprofit community organizations. So I, I respect and appreciate that. We should probably have a call offline. Yep. Thank you. We also have a question here from Council Member Lander. I start now. Thank you very much, Chair um, and Barika. It's good to see you. Um, two questions that I'll ask both of, and then you can answer, and then I'm done. Uh, one is actually, I just found your answer you just gave really interesting, and I was wondering whether you guys have thought within ANHD about like what an anti-racist approach to nonprofit development would be, and would looking at POC leadership and control be something that might make sense, so that we're making sure we're also pulling the nonprofit affordable housing sector in the direction of representing the folks who, you know, who, who um, you know, an anti-racist approach or people of color led approach. Um, and you can think about that for co-ops as well. Obviously, if you're creating a limited equity co-op that's gonna be owned, you know, overwhelmingly by uh, people of color, that's an ownership model that's putting wealth and control in the hands of working class and low income and BIPOC New Yorkers. Um, uh, and then my second question is if you could talk just a little about the scale question, obviously part of what, you know, HPD is saying is, well, we got a few CLTs and we could give them a few scraps, you know, a few units, but we can't have a seriously scaled program uh, because they don't yet have the capacity and, and we're going to like make them go through a drinking straw for a long, long time. So, you know, for those of us who would really like to see something scaled up, but of course do care about the resources to maintain the buildings and invest in the uh, leadership that's needed. You know, what, what would it, you know, what, what do you have to say about where the capacity is in the sector and what it would take to have the capacity in the sector that we want? Um, I'll take the, the second one first, if you don't mind. So I think, um, and I think the other person who could speak to this is probably Ryan from Cooper Square's um, experience with this as well. I think one of the challenges is the, that for the nonprofit sector, we are limited in our ability to scale by the agency's willingness to match us, right? So let's take in theory that if Cooper Square had been in a pace and position and had the funding and resources to support them, uh, standing up and, and expanding and investing in new buildings 10 years ago and then 10 years before that, where they would be versus what happens if that opportunity comes just three years ago or two or three years ago, right? So 
we ultimately are restricted in our ability to scale. And it's kind of this constant, like we're in this constant, the, and I'm bad at these things, wherever the circles, um, uh, where, um, you know, our, that we constantly hear the refrain of capacity, but our capacity is constrained as long as there is not a pipeline, right? So nonprofit members can't, they'll still say, oh, you need to show more units and, and bigger deals as capacity. But if we don't have those bigger deals to do, um, then we are not in a position to show that capacity, right? Yes, both nonprofit and poor for-profit sectors have actors that struggle with their portfolio and maintenance, but we also try to account for that internally. ANHD runs the Affordable Housing Institute to try to get everybody to the place as best we can of being able to properly run and manage quality buildings over time. Um, but I think the, the scale question is, we could, we could trickle through and do a little bit here and there for the next couple of months to a year and then scale up to a bigger scale in three years. But the moment in time to pull most of these units into preservation is going to be in the next three years. That is the critical time. So if we don't scale up until after this crisis is over, we're going to realize, oh, now we've got the, and this happened last time, oh, we've got the term sheets, we figured things out, and now there's no longer the buildings to then go and acquire and move into a preservation portfolio. And then we end up with the, well, we didn't really need this because only two buildings have happened with this term sheet. Well, of course, because now we're on the back end and there's only two or three buildings left. And it just becomes the self-fulfilling prophecy that just gets incredibly frustrating for all of us because we're like, we wanted to do this three years ago when there were 300 of them, right? So, um, and then I think to the other piece, I, I think it's a, to Councilmember uh, to Councilmember Carnegie's point. It's it's a little complicated because what we don't want to do also is be put in a place to as as nonprofit POC led nonprofits to be competing with our MWBE for profit partners. Um, oftentimes, those are local residents in the community too. Um, so, what we're really trying to do is think about um, how we don't get excluded, right? Uh, and, and I think that's the real concern now is that we don't want our, our POC leaders who choose to um, pursue a career in nonprofit uh, um, industry to then be excluded from the recognition of investing in, in POC based uh, development. Uh, and I think that that's something we're gonna have to struggle with, right? We technically, my owners are my board and my members. so. Uh, it becomes a little complicated in, in traditional terms to say, what's your ownership and do you have 51% um, people of color or women ownership? Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll move on to um, testimony from Deanir Del Rio, followed by Valerio Oselli and Kirk Goodrich. Time starts now. Okay, can you all hear me? Great. Um, good afternoon, committee chair Cornegie and members of the committee. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Deanira Del Rio and I'm the co-director of New Economy Project. We're a citywide organization that works to build an economy that works for all. Um, we work in coalition with grassroots groups throughout the city to advance cooperative and community-led development, um, including through community land trusts and social housing, as well as public banking, worker and financial co-ops and other strategies. Um, I just want to make a couple of points in my um, verbal testimony, which is one that we strongly support, Intro 1977, the Community Opportunity to Purchase Act, um, as well as Intro 118 to establish a municipal land bank. We strongly believe that New York City more than ever needs transformative and community-led solutions to our city's affordability crisis that advance racial equity and a just recovery. Passage of these bills will give communities and the city itself new tools to keep New Yorkers safely housed, to expand CLTs and social housing, and to curb speculation in the wake of COVID-19. Um, we wanna thank the council members, Rivera and Lander for their leadership and urge the committee to advance this legislation. Um, secondly, the legislation being considered today builds on groundbreaking steps that New York City has already taken to expand CLTs and social housing in all five boroughs. Most notably, the city council's discretionary funding that has provided absolutely vital training, support for training, incorporation of CLTs, grassroots leadership development, 
uh, partnerships, uh, including with nonprofit and other developers, property acquisition, and much more. I'm really sorry that you all didn't get a chance to hear from Athena uh, from East Harlem El Barrio CLT, which has made just massive progress um, in a few short years. Um, in the past couple of years, um, the city has, the, the CLT landscape has grown from one CLT to more than 15 that are established or in formation in black, brown, and immigrant neighborhoods across the five boroughs, from the South Bronx to Brownsville, East New York, Jackson Heights, and beyond. I just want to underscore that CLTs are a proven and flexible model. So there's a lot of talk about CLTs being new and untested but they've actually been in existence in high cost cities throughout the country, as well as in other areas for many decades. And there's many case examples, proof of concept that we can show both locally and nationally. Um, the local CLTs that are taking root are looking um, not just at affordable uh, housing, although obviously that's centered in their work, permanently affordable rental, as well as limited equity, um, housing, but also um, combating displacement of local small businesses that provide critical jobs and um, preserving green space and many other community needs. Um, CLTs also have a track record of stabilizing housing in the wake of economic downturns as well as natural disasters. Um, the CLTs that we're supporting throughout the city are also looking at community solar and just much more, um, you know, holistic community-wide development. Uh, by addressing, um, by addressing of unaffordable and substandard housing, as well as environmental degradation and many other conditions, CLTs are working to address root causes of housing and health disparities in the city, and they're creating conditions for true community safety and self-determination. So um, in short, the time is ripe for passage of legislation like COPA and, and creation of a land bank and other policies that can now build on the groundwork that's been laid in New York City um, and actually direct land and housing now to these CLTs, many of which have capacity, others which are partnering with experienced developers. Um, we urge that the final bill language strongly prioritize CLTs and others that commit to deep and permanent affordability and meaningful community governance. And as others have echoed, um, have, have already stated, I wanna echo that the council administration must work to develop dedicated funding sources so that CLTs and other qualified entities will have a real opportunity to purchase and reach deep affordability levels that their neighborhoods need. We look forward to working with this committee and the council at large to finalize and ensure passage of this critical legislation. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I asked the, the commissioner um, <clears throat> uh, about how she thought CLTs will impact communities or have impacted communities. You absolutely answered that in your in your testimony, but I just want to know if you can give me the top three ways, right? For those of us who don't have tremendous attention spans, what are the top three ways, in your opinion, that CLTs impact communities? I think that first of all, they, they have mechanisms for ongoing community organizing, education and engagement so that they facilitate true community decision-making over development in their neighborhoods. Um, secondly, that CLTs own and control development on the land. Um, and through that, they can ensure permanent affordability, working in partnership with an MHA, a limited equity co-op um, or any other kind of entity. Um, so those are two critical ways. And then um, the third, again, is just that um, CLTs can support holistic community development, not just housing, but thinking about all the things that you need for a neighborhood to thrive, for residents to have opportunities in terms of jobs, um, healthy food, uh, energy that's owned by the community. And the CLTs that we're working with around the city, you know, New York CLTs are in a unique position where many of them are getting off the ground at the same time. We did a lot of learning together through the learning exchange that has been mentioned. Um, groups are working together through the city council CLT initiative. And there's a lot of opportunity to support collaboration and scale uh, so that the CLT movement can grow and be sustainable over the long term. And then lastly, you know, my statement was that um, I've spent my entire career trying to create for affordability in every community. Uh, it seems as though whenever we have a program, whether it's good or bad, it focuses on or is relegated to communities of color 
in parts of the city that are of color. I want to know how CLTs can be scaled to meet the need of affordability in every single portion of our city. This, the way that we are doing affordability um, doesn't have much equity. So um, every community should be responsible for pitching in to create affordable environments. And we've done, we've been segregated so much as a city, which obviously impacts education and, and healthcare. So the disparities that the pandemic has illustrated are not only those disparities in and of themselves, but they're contributed to by the fact that we continue to segregate ourselves as a city. And a CLTs, which is a new model, which I happen to have an affinity for, are relegated to those very communities that have been insulated and, ha and the burden of affordability has been cast upon, then I think we're only gonna continue to, um, to propagate uh, unintentionally uh, segregation. What is your opinion about uh, creating or making sure that the model is applicable to every, every community um, and not just relegated to communities that have already been overburdened with the, the with having to carry affordability. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do wanna defer to some of the groups that are creating CLTs to talk about what their, why their communities identified that as the sort of next step that they need in promoting. I'm sorry, the only reason, the only reason I'm putting this on you is because you're so thorough and, and in depth that yeah. it warranted me to do that. It's not an indictment on you, I'm just, I'm just curious. No, I mean, I will just say that, um, you know, I think it's a little different in that the CLTs are, again, it's not just about planting, uh, you know, one type of housing development in a neighborhood that are, you know, as you were saying, that has sort of its share or more of um, affordable housing, but it's really about changing the underlying conditions in their communities and making sure that people in the neighborhood have a say over what kind of housing they get, if they get housing at all or what other kind of development that they need. So I think others here can speak more um, effectively based on their work and sort of how they, how again, their community members landed on CLTs and what needs they're trying to meet. Um, but your point's well taken. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Valeria Orselli, followed by Kirk Goodrich and Hannah Anusha. Valeria? Uh, no. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, Mr. Chair and members of the Housing and Building Committee, my name is Valeria Orselli. I'm the Project Director of This Land Is Our CLT. Who also members with Nicely, and I'm also a founding member of Cooper Square MHA and Cooper Square CLT. I'm here to support Intro 118 and Intro 1977. It is long overdue that New York City established a land bank. I support the proposal to prioritize disposition of properties acquired by the land bank to community land trusts while proposing the following additions. Commitment by the CLTs to explore expansion opportunities where they're financially and mission compatible. Secondly, CLT should have a demonstrated capacity. However, CLTs are only now becoming a citywide movement with many emerging organizations. The city needs to provide a capacity building funding stream and by that, I don't mean city council discretionary funds or enterprise grants that were that they use attorney general's office uh, money from a settlement, a steady funding stream. Third, to fairly compete with other bidders, the city needs to provide substantial funding for acquisition. For comparison, San Francisco allocated $3 million over three years for capacity building under their COPA program. New York City with more than nine times the population should allocate some $27 million for, for capacity building alone. San Francisco provided up to $375,000 per unit and a total of 37 million for acquisition in fiscal year 19 and 20. New York City should be able to provide some 343 million for acquisition. Buildings and tax lien sales should be prioritized for disposition of CLTs for redevelopment of low-income housing. The land bank and COPA should also look at underutilized city owned properties. Uh, that's properties owned by sanitation, parks. Do I have some Please continue. Please okay. continue. Other city owned properties, not just HPD owned properties, as they exist in the Lower East Side and also Chelsea, Clinton, the Upper West Side. It was mentioned by Ryan from Cooper Square that the housing affordability level at Cooper is 30% of AMI. And that has been true for the last 25 years. And the reason being that we relied 
on forgivable loans and enforcement mortgages. To the extent that you have to borrow money to create the renovation, that does not result in deeply affordable housing. That's something city council needs to address. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We will now hear from Kirk Goodrich, followed by Hannah Anusha and Azoria Fields. Kirk. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Oh, you got muted again. You have to unmute you once more. Kurt, you there you go. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Kirk Goodrich. I'm president of Bananak Development and chair of NYSAFA. I'm offering testimony in opposition to intro 1977. There seems to be a sense among the sponsors of this legislation that maximizing the ownership of multifamily housing assets in New York City by nonprofits is an ideal outcome for New Yorkers, although it is a fact that affordability is dictated by regulatory agreements and has nothing to do with the nonprofit status of owners. As someone who has spent the last 25 years financing and co-developing projects and, uh, with nonprofits, I don't need anyone to convince me of the greatness of community development corporations. While I am predisposed to see nonprofits as historic, as heroic in, uh, institutions, they have limitations and there are problems they cannot be expected to adequately address. Keep among them is the most intractable problem of the last century plus, which persists to this day the massive wealth disparity between what a black and white households. The median black household has just 13% of the wealth of the median white household. This is everything to do with federal policies which reinforce and extended patterns of racial discrimination in the real estate and finance industries. Despite the Civil Rights Act of 1968 and decades of social housing initiatives, including CLTs and limited equity co-ops, the wealth gap persists. Unfortunately, this problem has never been given the amount of attention in the community de development world that it deserves. Instead of only exploring ways to enhance nonprofit ownership, we should, focus, we should be focused on enabling hardworking New Yorkers, particularly those of color, who have been left behind to accumulate assets and close the wealth gap. This would allow families, historically disenfranchised group to borrow money to pay for education, start businesses. We need an affordable housing policy that sees people of color as more than just tenants and clients. Thank you. We will now hear from Hannah Anusha, followed by Azoria Fields and Sohair Hassan. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Council Member Cornegie. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Hannah Anouche, and I am the coordinator of the East New York Community Land Trust, and I'm also on staff at Cypress Hills Local Development Corporation, which has a long history of building and preserving deeply affordable housing in East New York. Um, the East New York Community Land Trust is a grassroots, people of color-led nonprofit founded by East New York and Brownsville residents dedicated to preserving affordable housing for future generations and building the generational wealth of the whole community. We're excited to announce that we recently incorporated as a nonprofit um, and we've been organizing more aggressively than ever um, during the pandemic. Um, we're also members of the Nicely Coalition. Um, we believe that the land bank and the community opportunity to purchase legislation are crucial steps um, that the city must take now to move property out of the speculative real estate market and into community ownership. Over the last six months, East New York has been leading the fight to abolish the tax lien sale. I wanna highlight that um, the city could replace the tax lien sale with a system that involves transferring distressed properties to the land bank, which would then transfer the properties to CLTs. Um, I also wanna point out that CLTs work in partnership with mission driven nonprofit developers um, like ours um, or developers. So prioritizing new CLTs like ours does not pr preclude land disposition to experienced nonprofit developers. It just adds a necessary layer of community stewardship and it also ensures that the housing is permanently affordable. Um, so I just wanna conclude by saying that we're looking forward to working with council to make sure that CLTs are prioritized um, and that these builds are tied to permanent funding streams. In order to promote social housing, the city really must leverage budget 
And we believe that the city can do this by defunding the NYPD and refund and reinvesting funds to social housing. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, now we'll hear from Azuria Field, followed by Sohair Hassan and Deborah Ack. Azuria? Hello? Yep, we hear you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on today. Uh, my name is Izora Field, and I am with the East New York Community Land Trust, and we are also a part of Nicely, which is the New York City, sorry, which is the New York City Community Land Initiative. And as a member of the East New York Community Land Trust, I come to you stating that we need to take bold action to make sure that property is taken care of and used to house people within our communities. As an organization, we have surveyed hundreds of lots that are city owned, owned by HPD and other city entities that could be used for housing our people. And it's not being used in that manner or any manner at the current time. And we need to take bold action on public land disposition and specifically on these city owned properties as has been done in other cities across the nation, including Philadelphia and Los Angeles. Now COVID has also added to our housing crisis causing more families to be displaced. And um, due to COVID, we have seen um, a pause of evictions and foreclosures. However, once the rent moratorium, the eviction moratorium is lifted, then we may see a huge influx of evictions and things like that in housing court. And so we have even more people we have to be concerned about housing. And uh, we are in support of the land bank as a method to actually, um, sorry? Your, your time has expired, but please bring, bring, please finish your statement. Okay, sorry. We are in support of the land initiative. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. We're actually now gonna move forward to uh, Deborah Eck, followed by Lyric Thompson and John Krinsky. Deborah. Good afternoon, Council and Council on Housing and Buildings. My name is Deborah Ack, and I am a resident of East New York and have been a resident here for 10 years, 12 years, just about. I am a board member of the East New York Community Land Trust, which is a which is a non-for-profit organization also affiliated with NICE, with the NICE Coalition. The East New York Community Land Trust is a grassroots, sorry, non-for-profit founded by community residents dedicated to preserving affordability for future generations and building the generational wealth of our community. We know that the time is right to create a community land trust because of the lessons we learned from the last economic crisis. Our fight for community control of the land is urgent. The pandemic is likely to exacerbate the predatory real estate activity as private financial actors look to take advantage of the real estate down cycle and residents increase economic vulnerability. I am excited to also announce that the East New York CLT has just recently been incorporated as a nonprofit organization. I am hereby, I am here to testify in support of the intro 1977-20, the Community Opportunity to Purchase legislation, better known as COPA, and also the 118-18 land bank legislation. We need the city council to take bold action to create this real social housing in New York City. And that means prioritizing CLTs when it comes to land disposition. East New York CLT 
has been leading the fight to abolish the tax lien sale. When the city abolishes the tax lien sale, it could transfer in foreclosed properties to land bank, to a land bank, which would then transfer the properties to CLTs and the other mission-driven nonprofits. CLTs work with mission-driven nonprofit developers. So prioritizing CLTs does not preclude land disposition to nonprofit developers. It just adds a necessary layer of community stewardship. With the COPA legislation, it will ensure that communities are taking care of each other. Who better to do this than the people of the community? I implore you now to advance these two legislations. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. We will now hear from Lyric Thompson, followed by John Krinsky and Ayo Harrington. Lyric? Thoughts now. Oh. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hi, Councilmember Carnegie. How are you doing? Good. How are you, Lyric? I'm still waiting for you to call me. Um, I am here to speak about HPD accountability or the lack thereof. We talk a good game about affordable housing and affordable housing is extremely important. I live in an area that's gentrifying and to be straight with you, I can't walk down the street without meeting somebody that's getting screwed in their rent stabilized apartment. Um, in particular, I'd like to bring up as an example, the MPLP program. Last week on Twitter, I uh, saw an advert by HPD for some new buildings. Accepting applications now, 16 newly renovated apartments at 2110, 2185 Amsterdam Avenue, 2488 7th Avenue, and 2794 8th Avenue. All units are rent stabilized and start at $695 a month. Not one of those buildings is registered with the Department of Housing Preservation and Development. How are the tenants supposed to know of their legal status if they don't bother to register the apartments? Um, which brings me to my issue with HPD, a lack of oversight. It's abusive and it is extremely expensive for our city when we have no oversight over these programs. I'm in a 421A building that was never completed. Rather than properly register our building, HPD simply rubber stamped the application, ignored all the fraudulent filings and threw us at 311. We have had over 300 inspections before I realized the entrance door on our building wasn't fire rated, which council member Cornegie, I'm gonna ask you again, sir, please have an oversight hearing into why HPD is not upholding the standards you know, regarding entrance, entrance doors. I mean, it's a matter of public safety that these doors are kept up to code. Um, one would have thought that the Bronx fire would have taught our city something, but we seem to hold on to an issue for about 10 seconds and then we just- Time expired. Council member Cornegie, the tenants at the Decatur buildings are still waiting for you to fulfill the promise you, you gave us two years ago when you said we were gonna have a sit down with HPD and straighten all this out. Why have you chosen to ghost us rather than help us? And that's all I have to say. Uh, thank you, Lyric. Uh, I'm very proud that um, you now have a new council member who is one of the most active and engaged council members in Dharma Diaz. I'm actually working with her to, to follow up with her on what she needs to do on the ground. We've already had several meetings on this and other meetings that are germane to HPD and her district. So I'll be following up with a uh, council member Yes, thank you. We will now hear from John Krinsky, followed by A.O. Harrington. John. Time starts now. Uh, Chairperson Carnegie, uh, members of the Housing and Buildings Committee, thank you for providing the opportunity to testify this afternoon. I hope you and yours are and remain well. My name is John Krinsky, and I'm a professor of political science and community change studies at City College and a founding board member of the City Community you, you, Land you, Initiative, you. on behalf of which I testified to nicely as an 18-year-old uh, eight-year-old coalition of neighborhood-based and citywide housing groups, community developers, economic justice organizations, and supporting organizations. We advocate for the expansion of community land trusts across the city to meet flexibly many of the challenges the city faces in providing deeply and permanently affordable housing, as well as other community-valued land uses. And as you saw, many of the organizations testifying today are members of NICELY. 
We're excited to support Intro 1977, uh, COPA, and thank Council Member Rivera for her leadership on the issue. COPA would level the playing field for community-based mission-driven housing groups such as community land trusts and help them to acquire property for long-term stewardship and deeply affordable housing and other uses. It's important, moreover, to develop funding streams that will make the opportunity to purchase real. We hope to discuss in the coming weeks and months ways to raise revenue for capital grants and deeper subsidy for community-based acquisition and stewardship of property. We're also excited to support Intro 118A, which would create a land bank for New York City. This bill, thanks to the leadership of Council Member Lander, is another important step in helping community land trusts and other nonprofits access land. A further bill not being considered today would prioritize community land trusts and other mission-driven nonprofits for public land disposition. And these bills recognize the centrality of the government in directing our most precious resource, land, to people or to profiteers. And they prefer the former over the latter in a break from decades of city policy. As a coalition of community land trusts, Nicely wishes to emphasize the importance of their strengths, even relative to other nonprofit organizations. They emphasize permanent affordability and a certain flexibility. Right? They can work with nonprofit housing developers and even potentially Mitchell Lama style landlords mutual housing associations and limited equity cooperatives, and even single family homeowners, while providing an extra level of stewardship, expertise, and economies of scale. In addition, CLTs can work with small businesses, whether retail or light industrial uses, making possible genuine local development where, where it might otherwise be priced out. CLTs around the country have worked with occupied Monka's question before. Further, CLT's stewardship has historically protected low and moderate income homeowners too. The limits on equity for homes on CLT owned land are compensated by the protection of housing from many foreclosure risks. In the 2008 crisis, foreclosure and the loss of equity in many black and brown households was at minuscule levels on CLT owned land. As we face a crisis of epic proportions, epic because of COVID's health and economic effects, only add to the sphere housing and homelessness crisis and crisis for small businesses and the jobs that went with them, we have a chance to intervene in areas of the real estate market that are at the root of the problems we face. And we can move toward a more economically and racially just city. And these bills are critical steps on this path. I would also just um, Note that we understand that the city is facing some of the most serious budget shortfalls it has for several generations. And yet, even as we may look forward to some federal aid, it's important to work on investing wisely in the future. And it's opposite to raise at this point that police overtime has amounted to nearly three quarters of a billion dollars in the last year alone, and further funds will likely be due from lawsuits against its poli protest policing tactics. So last summer's call to reallocate funding from the NYPD's budget to create opportunities for deeper justice still resonate. And so do calls for prioritizing housing over shelters, which now cost in the billions. Further, because upfront capital subsidy for affordable housing is one of the most important elements of reaching deep affordability, it may need to apply funding to acquisition and renovation. Other cities to fund affordable housing and it'll to consider as well at a significant level, while CLTs can actually preserve that the value of that subsidy in perpetuity because of it, the the 99 year renewable ground leases that it that they provide. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We will now hear from A.O. Harrington, and then we'll circle back to Athena Bernhoff one more time just to see if we still work those audio issues. Thank you, Oscar. Yeah. Time starts now. You're still muted, just one moment. Hi. There you go. Um, good afternoon. Um, I can attest to the fact that community land trusts have existed for decades. Ms. Harrington? Uh oh, you may have just lost a Harrington. One moment. In the meantime, can we circle back to Athena one more time to see if this audio works? 
Can y'all hear me? Can, yes. yes. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Thank you all. Thank you for trying again. Um, reading. Uh, oh, you muted again. One moment. Sorry, I'm back. Can y'all hear me? Yes. Apologies. Thank you. Yes. Um, good well, thank you again for circling back to me. I'm Athena Burnkoff. I'm the project coordinator at the East Harlem Barrio Community Land Trust, also a member of NICELY. Um, I'm here to speak in support of the land bank and COPA bills, which we believe to be important steps toward a just recovery for a city in crisis. We know New York City was in a housing crisis before COVID hit the scene. The city has spent millions of dollars on temporary and ineffective solutions to confront the outrageous number of people who are homeless every night or people who are constantly on the verge of eviction throughout the city. If a fundamental goal of ours collectively is to preserve affordable housing, then one of the most direct steps we can take to um, counter this is to give communities the opportunity to stay in and invest in the places where they already live. Similarly, if a fundamental goal is to restore affordable housing in the face of all that has been lost, there needs to be more deliberate mechanisms on the city level for directing land and property towards that purpose. The COPA and land bank bills are practical steps towards keeping people housed, ensuring long-term housing security, and increasing the affordable housing stock in the city. By prioritizing community land trusts, both of the bills account for the support systems necessary to implement these policies in alignment with the needs of black and brown working class communities. CLTs center the leadership of community members and actively build up community planning capacity through organizing, as well as stabilizing properties through long term uh, renewable ground leases. As mentioned earlier, East Harlem and Barrio CLT and our partner uh, Mutual Housing Association recently acquired four residential properties, some of which also have commercial spaces. It should be noted that many of the current tenants of these buildings have been living in terrible conditions or completely displaced from their own homes for over a decade. We're working currently with our community-based developer partner to rehab imp and improve the conditions in the properties and also develop a training series to equip residents to engage meaningfully in the stewardship of their homes and of spaces for local businesses. And with that said, CLTs are not only a viable option in New York, they're already here, we're growing. Um, and an expanded CLT ecosystem will allow for more and more communities to be equipped to effectively put these sorts of legislation into, into effect, as well as to contribute to the larger, more effective, equitable community planning processes throughout the city. It's our hope that these bills will also prevent more families from the years long struggle of securing rehab and operation support like the experience of some of the East Harlem Barrio community members. Um, of course, any uh, purchasing policy must be connected to permanent funding streams that allows community members to actually access and participate in some of these high cost transactions. We urge city council to establish these bills, move the, the legislation forward, but also invest in the resources needed to make them uh, effective. Thank you. Thank you. We'll circle back to uh, A.O. Harrington now. I stop now. Okay. Hello. Okay. Sorry about that. So um, I just wanted very quickly. Uh, Rain Community Land Trust is uh, over 30 years old. Uh, it is the first community land trust in New York State. I'm a long time resident since the 60s of the Lower East Side. Um, and for the record, um, we are located in Councilwoman Rivera's uh, district. So our trust evolved from the squatting movement. Um, I was lucky as a mom to find a group of people already organizing to secure abandoned affordable housing in the neighborhood. Long story short, today we are nine buildings. We have a 99 renewable ground lease with our buildings. There are 80, over 86 families in our building. And the original families like me literally gutted with our bare hands, no modern day equipment, um, our buildings with our bare, hand, bare hands, building and renovating. And while RAIN is a land trust, it is also made up of all HDFCs. HDFCs enjoyed great support from HPD in the early years. Uh, the city support has largely disappeared over the years. Um, many of the HDFCs as a result, well-intentioned, but suffered tax lien sales. Uh, they are no longer affordable to our community. On the other hand, without any consequence whatsoever from the city tasked with monitoring HDFCs, a few have sold for over a half a million dollars 
and at least two in recent years for over a million dollars. How did this happen and what did it do? It takes every single one of those units out of affordable housing for members of our community. So we're in support of intro 118A and um, 1977 as well. They are both needed to safeguard existing affordable housing and to secure more of it. However, uh, like one of the last speakers, we are very concerned, should they be approved, of how the city will provide sufficient funding and oversight of these initiatives. Um, and we recommend that the city start with buildings that are on the tax lien sale and specifically the 33,000 units of HDFCs, which might be in a financial distress right now uh, before a new generation of gentrifiers takes over these buildings as they already have started to so that they remain affordable in perpetuity, which was the, the intention of the state law. And finally, while I applaud the work of so many good intentioned organizations that have done much to move this conversation forward, uh, I would like for Black Lives Matter to not just be a slogan and to be a very much a part of the details and um, this, these laws and, and executing them and the oversight. Uh, so on behalf of RAIN CLT, uh, I look forward to working with your committee to make them a reality. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, Ms. Harrington, uh, hi, and thank you for your testimony. I'm curious as to why in previous testimonies, it would, there were only two CLT that, was meant, that were mentioned and yours wasn't mentioned. I can't really begin to tell you that. Maybe we can have an off offline conversation about okay. it. But okay. again, Rain Community Land Trust was the very first community land trust in all of New York State. Okay, so if somehow you could uh, drop your, well, I'll, I'll find you. I, I'd certainly love to be able to carry, carry on this conversation and see whether or not I'm missing other CLTs in the city that, that weren't mentioned earlier. That would be a very, that would be a grave concern to me. Understood. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thanks. This actually concludes our public testimony. So if you've inadvertently forgotten to call on someone to testify, if you could raise your hand now using the Zoom raise hand function, we can hear from you. Seeing none, I'll turn it over to Chair Cornegay to close the hearing. Again, I want to thank my colleagues for joining me today. I want to thank the advocates who testified. Um, I think it's very important at this particular juncture when we are having deep conversations about recovery and resiliency and piv pivoting and shifting to make sure a new model um, is considered as we go forward of affordability for the hardworking families in the city of New York. Thank you for this hearing. It is now concluded. <laughs>